husband, who has since been arrested for her murder. Cases of multiple contact with the police before violent escalation are all too common. Labour will mandate domestic abuse and wider violence against women and girls training for every police officer in the country, and we will introduce Renine's law to overhaul the policing response when reports are first made. So I ask the Minister, how many more women will have to die before the Government can do the same? Yes. Minister. Well, the Honourable Lady is right to mention the case of Osama Akhtar. It, it is appalling what happened to her. I obviously can't comment on any specifics in relation to the case, but she will know that the bail conditions that the perpetrator um, had been released under contained restrictions that were breached themselves. So it was not a case of the court refusing to apply conditions. It is that he breached them. In relation to her wider point, of course, every single one of these cases is a tragedy. She will know, because we've worked on a cross-party basis in the past, how much time and attention we dedicate to this at the Home Office. But I will sim simply say this. We now have domestic abuse training that has been rolled out to over 80 per cent of forces. The Home Secretary and I are working very, very closely with the nine outstanding ones. They are on a timetable for delivery. I want to reassure her of that. And we now, this month, have specialist trained uh, rape uh, specialists in every single police force in England and Wales. Tim Law. Number three, sir. Minister. Thank you. Uh, look, I thank my right honourable friend enormously for raising this question. Let me be quite clear that the hostile activity we have seen from Chinese authorities and state-affiliated groups poses a serious threat to the security and well-being of the British people and to our partners and allies across the world. The Deputy Prime Minister came to this chamber last month to speak about the pattern of malign activity, including the targeting of our parliamentarians and two malicious cyber campaigns by, cy by Chinese state-affiliated actors. We must never be afraid to stand up for ourselves and to call out this kind of activity that has targeted both him and me. Jim uh, Mr Speaker, can I add my personal condolences for your father's losses as well? Uh, can I say to my um, right honourable friend that, of course, we had the scandal about the hacking of MPs' uh, email accounts uh, back in March. We subsequently learned that the FBI had informed our government about this instance two years ago, as well as other foreign governments who had legislators uh, who were also affected. Why has it taken two years for us to be told about a serious security uh, breach? And will he now, with his colleagues in Cabinet, make sure that China is absolutely treated as and labelled as a threat and not just an epoch-defining systemic challenge, and everything is done urgently to put China in the enhanced tier of the Foreign Influence Registration Scheme. Yeah, yeah. Minister. My right honourable friend, who has given this House and our country uh, exceptional service over many years and, and will sadly be standing down in the next election, has made again some very, very strong uh, points. The first of which is that he knows the language that I use and he has heard the words that I have said. The reality is that we face threats from around the world and many of them, sadly, are emerging out of Beijing today. We know this, we've seen it, and many of us in this House feel it. So this is not something that we're shying away from. The reality, however, is that there are many different ways of answering it. Now, he's raised a very important aspect on FERS, and that's something that, of course, is being looked at. But he will have heard the words of the Deputy Prime Minister in this chamber only a few weeks ago, and how clearly he made himself heard. Yeah. Chris Bryant. I'm sorry, sorry, but I'm not convinced by the government's attitude on this. When the Deputy Prime Minister came to see us a few weeks ago, he didn't say anything new. He announced things about events that had happened two years ago. But the member himself knows of attempts by the Chinese government to undermine the work of the Foreign Affairs Committee of this House. Um, why, why are we only ever told about things that happened years ago? If we're surely to take these issues seriously, we have to have an up-to-date and present account of the, uh, the activities of the Chinese state. Minister. The right honourable member will know very well that when there is a reason to act quickly and to draw it to the attention of the House, we do, as is the case of Christine Lee, which you will remember involved the payment of money to a certain uh, member of this House. And the reason why we took that action was because, of course, we needed to expose it fast. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Biometrics and Surveillance Camera Commissioner said last year that our policing and security services were technologically vulnerable because of their use of Chinese-made equipment, including CCTV drones and body cameras. 
So, can the Minister say whether the digital asbestos of Chinese-made technology is still used in our policing and security infrastructure? Yes or no? Minister. My honourable friend will know very well that uh, the work of Mr Fraser last, when, before he retired last year or ended his mandate last year has been absolutely fantastically important to many of us in making sure, and I approve the term digital asbestos, uh, is got out of our institutions. This is something that is ongoing, so it has got out of the most secure sites already, but there are other areas where there is work to do. because, of course. There were an awful lot of sites, I'm afraid, which bought technology, which would now be problematic. Of course, it's not just static sites. There is, of course, the potential that some uh, electric vehicles could be easily turned into mobile intelligence gathering platforms by hostile states. And so it's not simply about looking at the past, but also at the future. I respect. Question four, sir. Minister. Uh, Mr Speaker, in 2023 we delivered a strong removal performance with overall returns back to pre-COVID levels. In total, 26,000 were returned, an increase of 74 per cent at an average of 500 removed every week last year. I'm grateful to the Minister's response. Uh, can he uh, update uh, the House on how his department is prioritising the return of foreign national offenders to their home countries uh, to keep the streets and communities of the United Kingdom safe. Minister. Well, Mr. Mr. Speaker, may I firstly pay tribute to my honourable friend and the work that goes on in his constituency, uh, because as he knows, I visited Gatwick recently and saw for myself uh, the good work of the, the Border Force work team were doing there, and he will be pleased to know that removals of foreign national offenders were up last year by 27 per cent and that we are committed to the removal of foreign criminals and those with no right to be in the United Kingdom. Yes, come on. Thank you, Mr Speaker. On that point, I sadly see many asylum seekers in Newport who are stuck in limbo due to this Government's incompetence. However, can I draw the Minister's attention to the case of a man in Newport who lied about his name and country of origin, is a convicted sex offender who has breached the terms of his licence and the courts want him returned home. He wants to return home and will even pay for his flight, but for some unfathomable reason. Um, the, the Home Office seem incapable of allowing or authorising or allowing this, and it's been three years. Why? Well, in, in, the removals were increased last year. It's interesting to note that those on the, of the party opposite have campaigned to ensure that they are preventing the deportation of foreign criminals, including the leader of the Labour Party. Those on this side of the House are determined to see foreign criminals removed, and there was an increase in removal of 74 per cent last year. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Under successive Conservative governments since 2010, returns of failed asylum seekers have collapsed by 44%, yeah. and returns of foreign national offenders have fallen by almost 30% over the same period. And for all the government's tough talk, only 2% of those arriving on small boats since 2018 have been returned anywhere, yet ministers are still resisting Labour's plan for a new returns and enforcement unit to ensure the swift removal of those with no right to be here. Meanwhile, more people crossed the channel in small boats over the weekend than will be covered in the entire first year of the failing Rwanda scheme. So will the minister stop the headline-chasing gimmicks and instead commit to setting out what his plan is for the 99% of people who are currently stuck in the asylum system who will never be sent to Rwanda. Yeah, yeah. Well, well, Mr Speaker, the fact of the matter is that nearly 18,000 foreign national offenders were returned between January 2019 and December 2023. The fact of the matter is members of the party opposite, including the leader of the Labour Party, have campaigned to prevent the deportation of foreign criminals, while those on this side of the House welcome an increase of 74 per cent, an average of 500 people being removed every single week. Andrew Weston. Question five, Mr mm -hmm. Speaker. Minister. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. Well, I'm very happy to uh, remind the House that we now have record, uh, we reached record numbers of police officers last year, in excess of 149,000 over 3,000 more than the previous peak under the last Labour government. And in terms of local policing, we achieved 67,785 as of March last year. I think the Minister might want to group them. 
Mr Speaker, you're, I always forget that. You're quite right. 8, 15, 16 and 18, with your permission. Andrew Weston. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Under this government, 10,000 neighbourhood police officers have disappeared since 2015 and are yet to be replaced on the front line. Given this government's pro proclivity for lifting Labour's policies, could I gently encourage the Minister to adopt Labour's plan to recruit 13,000 new neighbourhood police officers, allowing for a named contactable officer in every ward in the country? Yeah. Well, the Honourable Member is using figures uh, which go up to 2019. Uh, the reason he's using figures, of course, that are five years out of date is the numbers have gone up since then. And if you take neighbourhood policing as a whole, it's gone up from 61,083 in 2015. That's the year he mentioned. It's gone up 61,000 up to 67,785. That's an increase of 6,000. And I'm surprised he's not joining me in welcoming it. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Antisocial behaviour has been a big problem in Holyhead. Almost £700,000 of UK Government Safer Streets funding has been used for CCTV, improved lighting, self-defence training for local women and girls, delivering crime prevention packs and outreach work. Would the Minister join me in thanking Chief Inspector Robert Rands, PC Lisa Thomas and many others who work so hard to improve the lives of people who live and work in Holyhead? Well, I would certainly like to join her in thanking those officers and countless thousands of others around the country who do such good work. But on ASB, in addition to the Safer Streets money that my honourable friend mentioned, we are, uh, from the beginning of this month, funding an extra £66, uh, 66 million pounds, uh, to do antisocial behaviour hotspot patrolling. Every single one of England and Wales's police forces will get that, and that will make an enormous difference to combating the scourge of ASB. Paul Howell. <coughs> Thank you, Mr Speaker. Would the Minister agree with me that getting extra officers out in our communities should be the top of the list for any PCC? Unfortunately, in Durham, we see the Labour PCC more interested in increasing a back office staff and overseeing a declining standards, with the latest Peel report showing two, hour, two areas requiring improvement for the first time ever in Durham. Would he agree with me that the sooner we get an ex-beat cop like the Conservative candidate Rob Potts in place, yeah. the sooner Durham will return to being an outstanding police force? Yeah. Well, I completely agree with my honourable friend. Uh, spending money on things like flower beds and diversity staff instead of frontline police officers is the wrong priority. And I know that former frontline officers like Rob Potts running for PCC in Durham will do a good job of getting priorities straight. Debbie Abrahams. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Kosama Akhtar, who is from Oldham, was murdered by her estranged husband on a busy Bradford street in the middle of the day in front of their baby son. Research has repeatedly shown that regular foot patrols, especially in crime hotspots, leads to reduced offending and increased public confidence, particularly if combined with community-based prevention. Greater Manchester Police and West Yorkshire Police want to learn lessons from this tragic murder. What lessons has the Home Secretary learned about reducing neighbourhood policing and the prevalence of appalling crimes like this? Well, this is obviously a, a tragic case, and we'll obviously study any findings by the IOPC very, very carefully uh, indeed. She mentioned hotspot patrolling, and I mentioned in my last answer that the government is providing £66 million this financial year on top of the regular police funding settlement to fund hotspot patrolling, which I think may help in situations like these. Um, but just to repeat the point I made previously uh, about the local policing, local policing numbers since 2015 have gone up by about 6,500, and, and, and selectively quoting figures that are five years old does nothing to help public debate. James Boris. Thank, thank you, Mr Speaker. Hales Owen Police Station is under threat of closure from decisions taken by the Labour Police and Crime Commissioner for the West Midlands. And Tom Byrne, the Conservative candidate for PCC, it says that he will stop that closure programme. So would the Minister agree with me and Tom Byrne that keeping Hales Owen Police Station open is critical for community confidence and for the effectiveness of neighbourhood policing? Minister. Yes, I would agree very strongly. Uh, the Labour PCC's police station closure plans in the West Midlands are shocking. I note that West Midlands Police this year are getting an extra £50 million 
That is a 6.8% increase, well above the rate of inflation. And I think uh, Tom Byrne would do an excellent job making sure that maintains frontline services, which is exactly how that money should be spent. Mary Glendon. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Northumbria Force has lost 1,100 officers and £148 million from its budget since 2010. And even after the uplift, Northumbria remains 427 officers short when compared to 2010 levels. Will the Minister support the call by Northumbria's PCC, Kim McGuinness, for further investigation into police resources, as clearly not all areas of the country have benefited equally from the uplift programme? Minister. Well, I'm, I'm pleased to tell the House that the Northumbria Force, uh, this financial year, the year that started just a couple of weeks ago, their funding is going up by £28 million. That is a 7.6% increase, uh, over double the rate of inflation. So the resources are there. Using those resources wisely is a matter for police and crime commissioners. And, Mr Speaker, it tends to be Conservative police and crime commissioners who spend those resources most wisely. Ruth Cabrini. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Oh, sorry, question seven, Mr. Speaker. Secretary. Uh, Mr. Speaker, violence and abuse towards shop workers is not and will never be acceptable. Last October, the police published a retail crime action plan. The government has embraced that and enhanced it. Last week, we launched the Fighting Retail Crime uh, Action. Amongst other measures, it includes a commitment to create a new offence of assaulting a retail worker, something the sector has been calling for. Ruth Cadbury. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Last week, I met a shopkeeper in Hounslow who has been repeatedly targeted by shoplifters. The family who own the the, 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 the family who own the shop can't afford security guards or to lose a large amount of stock, unlike the big chains. It's welcome the government has finally backed Labour's 10-year campaign, along with Usdor and other campaigners, to introduce a standalone offence of assault against a shop worker. But will the minister go further? and scrap the unfair £200 limit, which leaves offenders getting away with impunity. Uh, Mr Speaker, it is still a criminal offence, irrespective of the uh, financial value of what uh, is, uh, is taken. Uh, we have made it clear of our commitment to ensure that shopkeepers uh, are protected and that the retail environment is safe. That is why we have put funding in place, which has put more police officers on the streets. That is why, as my right hon. Friend has just mentioned, uh, neighbourhood policing numbers are up. That is why we have, committed, to pursue, uh, that we have sorry, committed the police to pursue all reasonable lines of inquiry. And that is why I am very proud that we have put in place a specific criminal offence for assault against a retail worker. For our high streets to thrive, people need to perceive them as safe places to be. But there's real concern that the Mayor of London is failing to get the Met to take retail crime seriously enough. So does he agree that we need a new Mayor for London, Susan Hall, to ensure we have more effective policing in our high streets? Uh, quite, quite frankly, uh, Mr Speaker, uh, the Mayor of London has been a massive disappointment when it has come to the policing uh, of, uh, of London. Uh, it is the only police force in the country which is seeing its police numbers uh, reducing. It has failed to meet its recruitment uh, targets, and quite frankly, Mr. Speaker, Londoners deserve better. As the uh, chair of the All Party Group on Retail Crime, can I welcome the announcements, as I'm sure shop workers will everywhere? When will we be operationalised, and what is the monitoring process so that we can all judge it is not just words, but action? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr Speaker, the uh, hon. Gentleman makes an important point. We are putting it through as amendments to the Criminal Justice Bill. Uh, the quicker that that makes its passage through the House, the quicker we can put these specific changes in place. But we are not waiting for that. We have had conversations with police forces to make sure that there is visible policing on our high streets, that they respond to every reasonable uh, line of inquiry so that they send the signal 
to the retailers and also to potential criminals that we take this incredibly seriously and that they will respond to this important crime type. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, I realise the Home Secretary may be sick of hearing from me about assaults on retail workers, but I welcome the huge uh, and comprehensive package announced last week and well, by last week to support these people. Um, and, I, and I would like to thank... Well, Will my right honourable friend implement these as quickly as possible so as to benefit retail workers across Stockton South and the rest of the country? Yeah. Home Secretary. Mr Speaker, can I pay tribute to my honourable friend who has campaigned vigorously on this yeah, yeah, yeah. and has met with me on a number of occasions to go through the specifics of these uh, proposals, working closely with my right honourable friend, uh, the uh, Secretary of State for Justice, to make sure that both the policing response and, of course, the criminal uh, response uh, send a very clear deterrent message to those people who might be tempted to assault retail workers. It is not acceptable, and we will take action. Senator Minister for yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, in January, the government voted down our last, our latest attempt to introduce a standalone offence tackling violence against retail workers. Yeah. This continued a pattern of years of failing to address this issue while such violence reached epidemic proportions. Yeah. And last week, surprise, surprise, they U turned yeah. on this, and an, an offence is now to follow. When are the government going to follow this up by stealing uh, the other ideas they keep denying, a restoration of neighbourhood policing, and actually not the response officers they've been talking about, proper neighbourhood policing, yeah, 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 yeah. which is down between 2015 and 2023, yeah. and getting rid of the £200 limit? Yeah. 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 Mr Speaker, those people in the House should recognise that uh, just because a clause might have a similar sounding name does not mean it is the same. The simple truth of the matter, the simple truth of the matter is the clause that the opposition uh, put forward was deficient in many ways. The clause that we have put forward into the Criminal Justice Bill will address the issue. And when it comes to local, poli when it comes to local policing, she should recognise that there has been a 6,000 uplift in local policing. Question number nine, please, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, last year we launched the Antisocial Behaviour Action Plan, backed by £160 million worth of funding. Over 100,000 hours of police and other uniform patrols undertaken, targeting ASB hotspots, extended to every single uh, police force in England and Wales. We banned nitrous oxide, increased the fines for fly tipping, littering and graffiti, and we are strengthening powers to tackle, to tackle antisocial behaviour through the Criminal Justice Bill making its way through the House. Just didn't matter. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. One of the aspects of antisocial behaviour that really uh, annoys my constituents is persistent cannabis smoking from people inside their own homes, particularly in blocks of flats, but not exclusively. However, when I raise this with the police, they tell me that they're not going to go into people's homes and deal with it. I don't think that's good enough, does the Home Secretary? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Secretary I think Mr. Mr. Speaker, the police. And I've had this conversation with police uh, leaders from around the country. The police should take action where there is a credible uh, uh, um, uh, reporting of criminal uh, behaviour. Uh, and, uh, and that is a conversation we will continue to have with police. People need to be safe, but also feel safe in their communities and in their homes. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and my condolences to you, sir. Uh, protesters who recently created an obnoxious stunt outside the home of the Leader of the Opposition belong in jail, as do the trust fund vandals who caused tens of thousands of pounds worth of damage outside the Ministry of Defence last week. The truth is that frontline politicians of any political hue and our military personnel are prepared to put themselves forward to serve and protect this country, a concept the vandals, of course, would know nothing about. So when it comes to this type of antisocial behaviour, will my right honourable friend, the Home Secretary, look at increasing visibility? A couple of points there. Firstly, uh, it is completely unacceptable to try and intimidate parliamentarians of whatever political hue. And I, and I know that, um, that, that I, will stand I will stand shoulder to shoulder uh, with parliamentarians of whichever political party 
in defending parliamentarians' right to do and say what they believe to be in the best interests of their countries and their communities without fear of intimidation. That is an absolute red line, and it will be enforced. These, um, uh, these, petulant, these petulant acts of vandalism in the name of protests are unacceptable. When criminal damage occurs, that will be pursued. And indeed, in the Criminal Justice Bill, we're making specific actions to take away this veneer of defence that somehow it is justified criminal behaviour in, in, uh, uh, because people aren't getting their way at the ballot box. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Too many residents in Nottingham South tell me that antisocial behaviour is making their lives a misery. They never see uh, a Bobby walk in the streets. And under the law-breaking Tory Police and Crime Commissioner, yeah, yeah. Nottinghamshire Police has been placed in special measures with HMIC saying yeah. that the force is letting victims down. My constituents tell me they'll be voting for Labour's Gary Godden on the 2nd of May to rebuild neighbourhood policing and adopt a zero tolerance approach to antisocial behaviour. They're right, aren't they? Yeah. Yeah. Well, the they would be very wrong if they voted Labour expecting that would increase uh, a policing presence. Across, uh, the, across the country, we have seen over and over again that the best performing police areas are uh, most typically in control of Conservative police and crime. Uh, commissioners. Uh, I know the situation uh, in Nottinghamshire very well. I have spoken uh, directly uh, with the Police and Crime uh, Commissioner, who has a clear plan of action to ensure that she continues to put police officers uh, on the front line, something in Labour-run regions uh, in the area, police forces in the area, have been sadly lacking. Jonathan Gillis. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Due to an increase in antisocial behaviour in the town of Tunstall, I was proud to work with local residents, over 500 of them, in order to gain the support for new CCTV, new alley gates, and better street lighting through the Safer Streets funding. However, the Labour leader of Stoke on Trent City Council told me there would be no money for Tunstall when I met with her, and to make matters worse, has dumped some undesirables in the Sneed Arms Hotel in the town centre has led to further criminal activity that is blighting high street stores up and down our community. Doesn't the Home Secretary agree with me that, thank God, Ben Adams, Staffordshire's Police Fire and Crime Commissioner, was listening, and he did indeed make sure that we got that safer street funding and our community is going to make, uh, feel safer and people should vote for Ben on the 2nd of May? Home Secretary. Uh, Mr Speaker, I can hardly, I can hardly put it uh, better myself. I recently visited uh, the, wonderful, uh, the wonderful town of Stoke, seeing the passionate of the people, and this is a classic example of where local leadership in the hands of the Labour Party have failed people and local leadership in the hands of Conservatives have actually defended local people. Patrick Brady. Mr Speaker, number 10. Minister. Thank you, Mr Speaker. We're all concerned about the plight of those living in Gaza. Currently, we're not considering establishing a separate route for Palestinians. In any humanitarian situation, the UK must consider its resettlement approach in the round rather than on a crisis by crisis basis. Patrick Reddy. Mr. Speaker, I mean, it's not surprising that the Upper Tribunal found the decision uh, to require biometric data for people from Gaza uh, to be irrational and unreasonable because I think most of us find that to apply to most decisions made by the Home Office. Is it not also irrational and unreasonable for the United Kingdom to offer humanitarian visas for people caught up in the conflict in Ukraine, in Syria, and in Afghanistan, but to not offer humanitarian visas for people fleeing the conflict in Gaza? Minister. Well, I'm not going to give a running commentary on what is ongoing litigation, but what I can say, of course, is that we are supporting individuals, British um, nationals with dependents in Gaza, to get those individuals out of um, Gaza safely, working in collaboration with Foreign Office colleagues. There are also marked differences at play here. Of course, um, the right of return is fundamental as part of um, efforts towards a two-state solution, as well as other factors that are at play in relation to the Ukrainian response. For example, the dynamic is very different, and that affects directly the relationship we have with the Ukrainian government, particularly about being able to carry out checks on individuals. Some peace post person, Alison yeah, yeah. Gaza Families United's petition for a Palestinian family visa scheme has garnered now 100,000 yeah, yeah. signatures, and I hope will soon be debated in Parliament. Because Gazans are stuck in a cruel and irrational catch-22 situation. They can't cross the border to Egypt because they don't have a visa, because they can't get biometrics registered, but they can't get biometrics registered because they can't get to a visa application centre in Egypt. The government has the power to waive the requirement for these biometrics to be registered. It is in his hands to do so. Why won't he? 
Minister. She will appreciate that the security of the system is of imperative importance. We must act in accordance with those requirements. We do put that front and centre. I'm not going to comment on what is ongoing litigation, but what I can say is that we will continue to work with Foreign Office colleagues in the way that we've described. The elements of the peace process are at play in relation to these issues as well, but we will keep our response to this crisis under review as matters develop. Sir Desmond Swain. Eleven, sir. Minister. Thank you, Mr Speaker. With your permission, I'd like to group questions 11 and 12. The Home Office has been clear that use of hotels is a temporary and short-term measure to ensure we meet our statutory obligation to accommodate destitute asylum seekers. We've made significant progress in closing over 100 asylum hotels up till the end of March. Our actions mean there's now over 20,000 fewer asylum seekers in hotels today compared to six months ago. So Desmond Swift. Does his ambition extend to closing them all? Minister. Well, my, my right honourable friend is absolutely right that the government's ambition is to close these hotels. We have closed 100 at the end of March. We are working towards closing 150 by May. Of course, the objective is to alter the way in which people are accommodated to those more cost-effective and appropriate approaches, but fundamentally to also reduce the flow of people coming to this country illegally, which is the very best way of alleviating those pressures. So David Evans. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. And I welcome all the efforts my hon. Friend is making to deal with and to speed up the asylum process. However, can he outline what measures he is considering when deciding which hotels to close in each tranche going forward. My um, right hon. Friend will recognise that value for money is obviously a very um, critical consideration that informs hotel closure decisions, but also operational deliverability, the notice periods on contracts, but also recognising the needs in particular locations and some of the challenges that these sites present. We've got a plan. We are closing hotels and we're going to continue to deliver on precisely what we promised. Toby Perkins. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. The Sandpiper Hotel in Chesterfield has for almost two years now been being used uh, as a uh, hotel in, in this uh, way. Uh, when I've spoken to Derbyshire Refugee Support Group, they tell me not a single one of the people who stayed there has been, uh, has been asked to uh, go back to their country, and in fact, the vast majority of them have been approved, uh, which undermines the government's own sense that actually all of these uh, asylum seekers aren't entitled to be here. Actually, the government are improving the vast majority of them. So what a waste of money uh, it is. Uh, why does the government continue to fail in this way? And for the minister to come there and now sort of celebrate the extraordinary usage just because it's diminishing slightly is hopeless. When will we get the sandpiper back in public use? Well, I thought it was um, interesting that a Labour insider said to the Times newspaper last week in commentary, quote, we need a viable answer to what we do differently other than just smash the gangs. We can't currently say how we're going to tackle the demand side of the issue. They're absolutely right. I suspect we'll be waiting a very long time for the answer that goes right to the heart of the point that he raises. The honourable gentleman is saying we ought to be closing hotels, but it's only this government that has a credible plan to do just that. Jim Shannon. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, can I also, on behalf of myself and my party, pass on our, our, our condolences to you uh, on the death of your father? We, we know you loved your father, and we know your father loved you. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, uh, I would like to ask the Minister a question, if I can. When it comes to uh, 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 the reducing the number of asylum seekers, one of the options that I would suggest to the Minister is one that we could do, certainly in Strangford, we could do it anyway, that, that those people that are in hotels. We have companies in my constituency who wish to employ them. We have com companies who wish to give them accommodation at the same time. So if you want to help the asylum seekers in the hotels in my constituency and in my adjoining constituency, then let, me get the, let them get the jobs and let them get the accommodation. Well, I'm always very willing to engage with the um, honourable gentleman. He will appreciate the difficulty that we have in respect of that approach is the pull factor that that would present, encouraging people to potentially make dangerous journeys via small boats to get to the UK. We do not want to do anything that plays into the business model of the evil criminal gangs responsible for that miserable trade. What we want to do is put them out of business. But on the wider accommodation point, I'm very happy to engage with him. Mr. Speaker. 
In 2016, Middlesbrough had the highest ratio of asylum seekers per head of population of anywhere in England. And I welcome the closure of hotels, but I worry about reports in today's Daily Mail that the Home Office is now buying up large amounts of property in some of the poorer areas of England, which risks uh, taking us back to the situation we saw uh, in 2016. Will the Minister reassure me that this isn't the case, because my constituents are clear that this place is an unacceptable strain on the community and indeed an unhappy strain on community cohesion? Minister. My um, right honourable friend is a strong supporter of the work that the government is doing to get a better grip on the flow of people coming across to our country who inevitably need accommodating whilst they are here. We have a mixture of accommodation to meet those needs. Getting the numbers down is critical to be able to reduce that dependence. What I am able to say, however, is that we are not actively pursuing procurement in the three local authorities cited in the article that he references, and that includes Middlesbrough. Mike Thank you, Mr Speaker, and sincere condolences. Um, the Government promised some considerable time ago that a hotel used in my constituency would no longer be used in my constituency to house those seeking asylum. It's not the case. It's almost become de facto permanent. Could the Minister speak to me, not necessarily on the floor of the House, but separately, and give me assurance that there will be a, a managed closure of that facility? Minister. What I can't do on the floor of the House is to make commitments about specific hotels, but I'd be very happy to meet with him to discuss this. What he could do to help me with this particular challenge is to get behind the work that the government is doing to help reduce the flow of people coming to the UK that fundamentally and crucially would help us to be able to close hotels such as the one in his constituency. We now come to topicals. Sir John Whittingdale. Number one, sir. Home Secretary. Uh, Mr Speaker, we have uh, increased the volume of asylum processing uh, cases. We have successfully met a ministerial commitment to close over 50 asylum-seeking hotels uh, in, by January 2024, and we have closed over 100 by the end of March. Last year, I brought forward measures to make legal migration fairer and radically reduce uh, the numbers. 300,000 people who came to the UK last year would not be now eligible to do so. Anyone who wants to bring a family from abroad must be able to support them uh, comfortably uh, financially. And in the budget, we, uh, the government put forward £75 million to roll out violence reduction units and hotspot policing across the UK, sorry, across England and Wales and £230 million for technology that will save the police time and money and make sure that police officers are on the front line doing the job they were recruited to do. Sir John. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker, and can I have my own condolences? Um, my right friend will be aware that police numbers in Essex are now at record levels and that overall crime is down. However, there has been a rise in vehicle theft. Will my right friend therefore welcome the efforts of our excellent Police, Fire and Crime Commissioner Roger Hurst in establishing a Stolen Vehicles Intelligence Unit, which has so far recovered £14 million worth of vehicles, and will he look at what further support can be given to him to tackle this uh, crime? Uh, my right honourable friend is, um, is right to highlight the fantastic work of uh, Roger Hurst and the uh, Stolen Vehicle uh, intelligence uh, unit. There have been a number of large scale uh, uh, seizures of vehicles being uh, attempted to be uh, exported. Uh, this government has reduced vehicle related crime by 39 per cent since 2010. Uh, through the Criminal Justice Bill, we seek to go further. But innovative approaches, like the one put forward by Roger Hurst, is exactly what we want to see more of. And that is why I am very proud to campaign alongside him. Uh, because he has done fantastic work protecting the people of Essex. Shadow Home Secretary Yvette Cooper. Mr Speaker, I remember the the kindness your father showed me in our long discussions on rugby league and add my condolences to. And 35 years ago to the hour was the Hillsborough tragedy. And we remember the 97 who were lost and support the family's campaign for a Hillsborough law. Yeah. Mr Speaker, we strongly condemn the attack by Isra Iran on Israel this weekend, and we must do everything we can to prevent further escalation in the Middle East. But there are also domestic security issues over Iran. 
The Iran international journalist Puria Zarati was attacked on the streets of London a few weeks ago following repeated Iran-related security threats on British soil, including threats to kidnap and to kill. Does the Home Secretary believe it is now time to prescribe the IRGC in the UK? Uh, Mr Speaker, the Right Honourable uh, Lady will know that we keep our uh, response to Iran consistently under review, and of course we have done so in the light of the attacks uh, in Wimbledon. Um, but she will also know that we do not uh, speculate about future designations or uh, sanctions, but she will also know the IRGC is sanctioned it's in, in its entirety. A number of members of the IRGC are sanctioned as individuals. As she knows, we will keep this constantly under review. Beck Cooper. The Home Secretary will know we have raised this uh, many times, and I understand the complexity of the issue. The prescribing legislation was drawn up over 20 years ago to address then terrorist threats like Al Qaeda rather than state sponsored threats where there might be both domestic and international security objectives. But our bottom line must be keeping this country safe, and that's why Labour has proposed new security legislation to allow the government to put appropriately targeted targeted prescription style restrictions on the operations of state-linked organisations like the IRGC. The government previously resisted this, but will he look at this again in the light of recent events and work with us on any legislation needed to keep this country safe? Yeah, yeah. Home Secretary. Uh, Mr Speaker, we have the National uh, Security Act and we have a range of tools at our uh, disposal. Uh, our defence against state threats is a priority. It's one of the priorities of uh, the Department, and my right honourable friend, uh, the Security Minister, uh, leads on the practical implementation of that. I can reassure her and the House that we constantly review the range of options at our disposal. We deploy those that are the most appropriate. The protection of the UK and the people living and working within it against state threats will always be a priority of this government. Bell. Will my right honourable friend, the Minister for Crime and Policing, support the excellent initiative of a number of Conservative Police and Crime Commissioners to include filling in potholes as part of the Community Payback Initiative for convicted offenders? And will he apply pressure on the Ministry of Justice to get this up and running as soon as possible? <laughs> Well, I think my honourable friend, the member for Kettering, uh, has raised an excellent idea. It has my enthusiastic support, and I will most certainly do exactly as he asks straight away. Sir Dyke. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and my condolences to you. Uh, the former Chief Inspector of Borders and Immigration recently produced a report that stated 275 certificates of sponsorship were granted to a company that used forged documents purporting to be a real care home. Clearly, failures like this from the Home Office leave people at risk of exploitation and modern slavery. So, what steps is the Minister taking to make the system more robust and to protect vulnerable people who come here to work in our care system? Minister. Well, I'm grateful to the Honourable Lady for that question, and we um, responded within the eight week deadline to that um, ICIBI report. We accepted the recommendations that were posed to us in it. We are working through those recommendations, but there was already work in train, particularly working in collaboration with the Care Quality Commission to have better accreditation practices around um, care providers when we're matching people to those visas. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Outdated laws are allowing child sexual predators uh, and offenders to enter or leave our country whilst in possession of illegal material on their digital devices because the border force do not have the power to access them. Would my right honourable friend work with his colleagues in the Ministry of Justice to consider the merits of a new offence of willful obstruction under which an individual could be prosecuted if they fail to unlock their devices so, if, so they can be properly searched? Minister. Well, I thank the honourable lady for her work in this area. The issues she raises are of direct importance to intelligence gathering and child protection. My officials have been working closely with Border Force to ensure that their powers keep pace with the digital age. When the next legislative opportunity arises, if not before, 
we will carefully consider border force powers to compel individuals to submit to searches of their devices if they're suspected of holding child sexual abuse material. Toby Perkins. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. The murder of Gracie Spinks uh, in Chesterfield sent shockwaves through the town and the report into Derbyshire Policing's the Derbyshire Police's handling of that uh, was uh, a very salutary uh, and, and desperately unhappy situation. Uh, there is still far too much inconsistency into how stalking and violence uh, against women uh, is handled. So, will the Home Secretary uh, back Labour's plan to bring in mandatory national standards uh, and mandatory training on violence against women so that we see consistency on stalking and policing right across the country? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Mr Speaker, I can reassure the Honourable Gentleman and the House uh, that under my leadership the Home Office and policing across the UK will maintain its focus on preventing violence against women and girls. Uh, we do have a rollout of guidance and training for the policing of women and girls. I will take his uh, proposals, I will listen carefully to the proposals he's put forward because we want to make sure that women and girls in the country feel safe. Government champions fantastic animal welfare standards. Yeah. My constituents would like to see alternatives to animal testing wherever possible and would be keen to hear a vital update from the department. Yeah. Minister. Well, given the interest will be about to switch in this House to uh, a different matter, I'll be very brief and promise to write to her, but she should know that this government has already doubled the spending on finding alternatives to annual testing and will continue to make sure that the inspection regime is as strict as possible to make sure that when animals need to be used, the conditions are as humane as possible. Mr. Maddows. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can the Home Secretary tell us the level of auditing that will take place in relation to the hundreds of millions of pounds being spent to, sent to Rwanda? And in particular, can he guarantee that no UK taxpayers' cash will either directly or indirectly be used to fund the M23 militia in the Democratic Republic of Congo? Uh, Mr. Speaker, all our overseas expenditure, whether it's through official development assistance or whether it is uh, through contractual relationships we have, like the ones with Rwanda, are always robustly pleased to ensure that they are spent exclusively on the issues that they are uh, designed to do. Um, uh, we have a very, very strong uh, and good working relationship with the government of Rwanda, who are absolutely committed to be the exporter of solutions to global <laughs> problems rather than the exporter of problems. Andrew Rosenberg. Mr Speaker, sir, the, the people of Romford are angry. They're not getting the police cover from the Mayor of London that we pay for. We're seeing a crime wave across Romford in Gidea Park, a stabbing in the town centre. We have had enough. Will the Minister please ensure that there is reform so that Essex towns like Romford actually get the service that Roger Hurst gives to the people of the historic county? Well, he is quite right to draw the contrast between the excellent work done by Roger Hurst in Essex with the appalling job being done by Sadiq Khan in London. Sadiq, Sadiq Khan is the only one of the 43 police and crime commissioners to have missed his recruitment targets and tragically, tragically, police officer numbers in London are falling by contrast to the rest of the country. Londoners will have a chance to cast their vote on May the 2nd and I hope they kick him out. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, my constituent, Maisara, is a British citizen and his parents live in Gaza. His parents successfully applied for visas to visit him in autumn last year, but they were unable to travel after October the 7th and their visas expired. I contacted the Home Office on my Sarah's behalf to ask if these visas could be extended, and I was told they would have to make new applications. There are, however, of course, no functioning visa application centres in Gaza, so can the Minister explain what exactly my constituents' parents should do? Home Secretary. Uh, Mr Speaker, I am more than happy to look at the details of the case. Of course, he has to understand that just as uh, the circumstances on the ground changed dramatically after Hamas's brutal mass murder rampage on the 7th of October. Our posture and our security posture for that reason has got understandably to be enhanced. This is not me making any implications about his constituents' family, but he and the House will understand that we must be careful in everything we do when it comes to accepting uh, uh, people who are leaving Gaza in these circumstances. 
That completes Home Office questions. We now come to the statement. I now call the Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, before I start, I'd like to express my deepest sympathy, and I'm sure that of the whole House, on the death of your father. He, he was a true giant, not just of this House, but of the other place too. I also want to express my solidarity with our Australian friends after the horrific and senseless attacks in Sydney in recent days. Our thoughts are with all those affected. Mr Speaker, on Saturday evening, Iran sought to plunge the Middle East into a new crisis. They launched a barrage of missiles and attack drones over Iraq and Jordan and towards Israel. The scale of the attack and the fact that it was targeted directly at Israel are without precedent. It was a reckless and dangerous escalation. If it had succeeded, the fallout for regional security and the toll on Israeli citizens would have been catastrophic. But, Mr Speaker, it did not succeed. In support of Israel's own defensive action, the United Kingdom joined a US-led international effort, along with France and partners in the region, which intercepted almost all of the missiles, saving lives in Israel and its neighbours. We sent additional RAF typhoons to the region as part of our existing operations against Daesh in Iraq and Syria. And I can confirm our forces destroyed a number of Iranian drones. We also provided important intelligence, surveillance and reconnaissance support for our partners. Mr Speaker, our pilots put themselves in harm's way to protect the innocent and preserve peace and stability. I spoke to the RAF earlier today. They are the best of the best, and I know the whole House will join me in expressing our gratitude. Mr Speaker, with this attack, Iran has once again shown its true colours. They are intent on sowing chaos in their own backyard, on further destabilising the Middle East. Our aim is to support stability and security, because it is right for the region and because, although the Middle East is thousands of miles away, it has a direct effect on our security and prosperity at home. So we are working urgently with our allies to de-escalate the situation and prevent further bloodshed. We want to see calmer heads prevail and we are directing all our diplomatic efforts to that end. Yesterday, I spoke to my fellow G7 leaders. We are united in our condemnation of this attack. We discussed further potential diplomatic measures, which we will be working together to coordinate in the coming days. I will also shortly be speaking to Prime Minister Netanyahu to express our solidarity with Israel in the face of this attack and to discuss how we can prevent further escalation. All sides must show restraint. Mr Speaker, our action reflects our wider strategy in the Middle East, which I have set out in this House previously. I believe there are three vital steps to put the region onto a better path. First, we must uphold regional security against hostile actors, including in the Red Sea, and we must ensure Israel's security. That is non-negotiable. It is a fundamental condition for peace in the region. In the face of threats like we saw this weekend, Israel has our full support. Second, we must invest more deeply in the two-state solution. That is what we have been doing over the past six months, including working closely with the Palestinian Authority, so that when the time comes, they can provide more effective governance for Gaza and the West Bank. Mr Speaker, it is significant that other regional partners actually helped to prevent a much worse attack over the weekend. It reminds us how important the attempts to normalise relations between Israel and its neighbours really are, and it holds out precious hope for the region. Third, Mr Speaker, the conflict in Gaza must end. Hamas, which is backed by Iran, started this war. They wanted not just to kill and murder, but to destabilise the whole region. This weekend, they rejected the latest hostage deal, which offered a road to a ceasefire. It is Israel's right, and indeed its duty, to defeat the threat from Hamas terrorists and defend its security. And I want to be clear, nothing that has happened over the last 48 hours affects our position on Gaza. The appalling toll on civilians continues to grow, 
the hunger, the desperation, the loss of life on an awful scale. The whole country wants to see an end to the bloodshed and to see more humanitarian support going in. The, re the recent increase in aid flows is positive, but it is still not enough. We need to see new crossings open for longer to get in vital supplies. And Mr Speaker, I want to take this opportunity to pay tribute to the three British aid workers who were killed in Gaza. John Chapman, James Kirby and James Henderson. They were heroes. The children of Gaza, who they were risking their lives to feed, need a humanitarian pause immediately, leading to a long-term sustainable ceasefire. That is the fastest way to get hostages out and aid in, and to stop the fighting. Israelis and Palestinians alike deserve to live in peace, dignity and security, and so do people across the entire region. In conclusion, Mr Speaker, Saturday's attack was the act not of a people, but of a despotic regime. Yeah. Yeah. And it is emblematic of the dangers that we face today. The links between such regimes are growing. Tel Aviv was not the only target of Iranian drones on Saturday. Putin was also launching them at Kyiv and Kharkiv. And who was the sole voice speaking up for Iran yesterday, seeking to justify their actions? Russia. The threats to stability are growing, not just in the Middle East, but everywhere. And we are meeting those threats time after time, with British forces at the forefront. It's why our pilots were in action this weekend. It's why they have been policing the skies above Iraq and Syria for a decade. It's why our sailors are defending the freedom of navigation in the Red Sea against the reckless attacks of the Iran-backed Houthi militia. It's why our soldiers are on the ground in Kosovo, Estonia, Poland and more. And it's why we have led the way in backing Ukraine and will continue to back them for as long as it takes. When adversaries like Russia or Iran threaten peace and prosperity, we will always stand in their way, ready to defend our values and our interests, shoulder to shoulder with our friends and our allies. And I commend this statement to the House. Yeah. Yeah. Leader of the Opposition, Keir Starmer. Yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I'd like to thank the Prime Minister for advance copy of his statement and for the regular briefings on the developing situation in the Middle East. I also thank the Prime Minister for his warm tribute to your father, Mr Speaker, Doug Hoyle, a great servant of our party, respected by all who knew him. Yeah. I also join the Prime Minister in offering our solidarity with the victims of the horrific attack in Sydney and in recognising the heroism of the three British aid workers killed in Gaza while working for World Kitchen. Turning to the events of this weekend, we support the defensive action taken by the UK over the weekend alongside our international allies against the Iranian attacks on Israel, and we welcome the Prime Minister's call for restraint. Once again, we all salute the professionalism and bravery of our armed forces. We also support the RAF planes being sent to the region to bolster Operation Shader. Their efforts are vital for a safer world. Mr Speaker, there can be no doubt that the attack perpetrated by Iranian forces this weekend has left the world a more dangerous place it targeted innocent civilians with a clear intent to destabilise the region. It must be wholly condemned by all. But, Mr Speaker, let us also be clear. A full-scale conflict in the Middle East is in no one's interest. It is a path that can only lead to more bloodshed, more instability and the unleashing of forces that are beyond the ability of anyone to control. Mr Speaker, the combined defensive action this weekend was a success, and because of that, lives were saved. As a result, escalation is not inevitable. In repelling the attack, Israel showed strength and courage. It must now show the same strength and courage to de-escalate. That has to be the primary objective. 
And Mr Speaker, that is the responsibility of all sides and every partner. We must be resolute and united in our support for the collective security of Israel, Jordan and other partners in the region. But tensions remain very high. We must proceed calmly, carefully and with restraint. Because if diplomacy takes centre stage, and it must, then we also need to be clear diplomatic premises should not be targeted and attacked. That is a point of principle. But as the condemnation from our G7 allies rightly notes, Iran's response this weekend was unprecedented, a further step towards the destabilisation of the region and the risk of escalation. And nobody in this House should be or is under any illusion. This is a regime that sponsors terror across the Middle East and beyond, that murders and represses its own people and supports Putin's war efforts in Ukraine. So can the Prime Minister update the House on any new steps he's taking with our international partners to pursue sanctions against the regime? And can he clarify what steps he's taking to limit the power of the Revolutionary Guard to glorify terrorism here in the UK? Mr Speaker, whilst there is no justification for Iran's actions, we cannot be naive to the fact that one of the drivers of tension in the region is the ongoing war in Gaza. Six months on from the horrific Hamas terror attack, hostages remain separated from their families. Thousands of innocent Palestinians have been killed. And now more than a million people face the imminent threat of famine. So I urge the government again to use every ounce of diplomatic leverage that we have to make sure aid to Gaza is unimpeded and drastically scaled up. Alongside that, we reiterate our call for an immediate ceasefire, yep. for Hamas to release hostages, and for a return to a diplomatic process that can rekindle the hope of a two-state solution. Yeah. Yeah. Mr Speaker, it is right that we condemn Iran's action. It is right that we work with others to defend the security of our allies, and it is right that we seek the end of conflict in Gaza. But this is a moment for restraint, because escalation will only lead to further destruction. And for the sake of all those still caught in the horror and violence, that must be avoided. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Mr Speaker, I thank the right honourable gentleman for his support of the government's actions. Uh, with regard to what might happen going forward, ultimately Israel has a right to self-defence, as any state does. And the G7 leader spoke yesterday and unequivocally condemned Iran's attack and expressed full solidarity and support for Israel and its people. Uh, but as the Foreign Secretary said this morning, this is a time to be smart as well as tough. Uh, Iran, Israel has successfully repelled incredibly successfully repelled the Iranian attack, and Iran is even more isolated on the world stage. And as others have said, we would urge them to take the win at this point. We want to avoid further escalation and bloodshed. He's right that it would be deeply destabilising for the region and risks more lives, and all our diplomatics at this point will be geared towards that goal in partnership with our allies. Uh, next, just turning to Iran. Um, as it, the behaviour of the Iranian regime, as I've said previously, in, including the actions of the IRGC, poses a significant threat to the safety and security of the UK and our allies. And yesterday at the G7, we agreed to work together on further measures to counter the Iranian regime and its proxies. Uh, it was agreed that we should coordinate those actions, and that work is now underway. And obviously, at the appropriate time, either I or ministers will update the House. We have already sanctioned, as he will know, over 400 Iranian individuals, including the IRGC in its entirety. We have a new sanctions regime to enable us to, what well, gives us more extensive powers to designate uh, sanctions uh, that we put in place at the end of last year. And of course, the National Security Act, it creates new offences for espionage and foreign interference and means that our security services have the powers that they need to deter, disrupt and uh, detect threats 
of a more modern nature from states like Iran. Uh, and lastly, uh, with regard to diplomacy for Israel and the region, we are absolutely committed to a two-state solution and working very hard uh, using all our efforts to bring that about, particularly over the last few months, building up the capability, as I said, of the Palestinian Authority so that they have the technical and administrative capability that is necessary uh, when the moment comes for them to provide effective governments, uh, governance in uh, the West Bank and Gaza. It is absolutely my view and the government's view that Israelis and Palestinians should have the opportunity to live side by side in peace, with security, dignity and opportunity, and I'm proud of the role that the United Kingdom is playing. Yeah, yeah. Foreign Affairs Select Committee, Alicia Cairns. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My condolences on the loss of your father. This remains a very dangerous moment, and yet over the weekend we saw a demonstration of unity and purpose. We saw the depth of will for normalisation and for a secure future for all peoples of the Middle East. Restraint is vital if we want to build on the momentum, to get hostages home to their families, to get improvements to continue on aid. But to better protect our people, will my right honourable friend commit to launch a new consensus on Iran with our allies and a new effort with a combined diplomatic, military and wider experts areas to limit the extent of the atrocities of Iran? We need to end the compartmentalisation of the threats when we deal with them. We must deal with them as one, whether it be nuclear ambitions, the arming of the militia, femicide or transnational repression. But only with a new consensus will we see that progress. So will he please commit to leading that internationally? Uh, speaker, I, uh, I can give the Honourable Lady that uh, commitment, and that is exactly the subject of our discussions yesterday uh, amongst G7 leaders. And she mentioned nuclear. Iran's nuclear programme has never been more advanced than it is today and threatens international peace and security. Uh, and there is no, absolutely no justification uh, for the, uh, at a civilian level for the enrichment that we are seeing that the IAEA has reported in Iran. And I want to reassure her that we are considering next steps on the nuclear file with our international partners. And we are committed to using all diplomatic tools available to ensure that Iran never develops a nuclear weapon, uh, including using the snapback mechanism if necessary. SNP spokesperson Murray Black. I want to echo the Prime Minister and not only passing on our thoughts to you, Mr Speaker, but also to the families of those aid workers who have been killed in Gaza. Now, I want to begin by condemning the acts of violence by the Iranian regime. These acts are no more than a cynical attempt to exploit the suffering, the pain and the turmoil being experienced by those people in Palestine right now. And whilst we rightly condemn the violent acts of Iran, so too must we condemn the violent acts of Israel. Listening to the interviews that he's been given, the Foreign Secretary is correct in his attempt to uphold the principle of proportionality. But if 100 missiles in retaliation to an isolated attack on an embassy is correctly constitutes as disproportionate, then so too must Israel's 192 days bombardment of Gaza. Yeah, yeah. Now, we yeah, know yeah. that the agenda in Tehran is to bring about as much instability as possible. We all have a responsibility to ensure that that does not happen. There is not going to be a military solution to the conflict in the Middle East. There must be a political and diplomatic solution. So what is required now is the same as what was required six months ago. We need de-escalating and the causes of conflict in the region to be reviewed. Now, the biggest continuing cause of conflict is the siege of Gaza, hence the need for a ceasefire. So can the Prime Minister outline what he is doing to ensure that the UN Security Council mandated ceasefire becomes a reality? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Mr Speaker, I think, first of all, it's important not to try and draw any equivalence between 
Israel's, Israel's absolute right and duty to provide security for its citizens in the face of an appalling terrorist atrocity uh, and indeed what happened over the, the weekend. Uh, these things are just not, uh, not remotely the same. So uh, and we will more broadly though, as I've said repeatedly from this dispatch box, urge Israel to abide by international humanitarian law. It's been, we've been very clear that too many civilians have been killed and we're deeply concerned about the impact on the civilian population uh, in Gaza and our diplomatic efforts are geared towards alleviating that suffering and I'll continue to raise these points with Prime Minister Netanyahu uh, when I speak to him uh, but as I said drawing equivalence between these two things is absolutely the not right thing to do. Absolutely. Of the Defence Select Committee, Jeremy Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Notwithstanding the sheer scale of the Iranian attack, multi-layered air defence proved Effective. Are we ensuring that any learnings we picked up we're passing on to Ukraine for the use of their own defence? And in a more hostile and dangerous world, and with the ever increasing proliferation of missile and drone technology, are we reviewing our own air defence assets and capabilities to support our allies and indeed closer to home if ever required? Um, well, Mr. Mr. Speaker, can I thank my old friend for an excellent question? He's right about the importance of air defence, which is why it has repeatedly been one of the key capabilities that we have sought to provide to Ukraine, uh, something that we have led on uh, for some time, and ditto uh, with some of the new contracts that we've placed most recently this year to replenish UK stockpiles, also um, cover air defence missiles. Uh, he's more broadly right that we need to ensure that our industrial production here in the UK is geared to produce the capabilities that we need, whether it's for our own use or for Ukraine's use. And I'm pleased to say the Defence Secretary is working with the industry to ensure that supply chain is there to meet those needs. Ed David. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can I send you and your family our deepest condolences on the loss of your father? And can I associate myself and my colleagues with the comments of others about the appalling murder, murders in Sydney and the death of the aid workers in Gaza? Mr. Speaker, can I thank the Prime Minister for his statement? The Liberal Democrats join him in condemning Iran's attack on Israel. This is an alarming escalation in a conflict that has already seen far too many deaths and suffering. So we support the action taken by the RAF to intercept Iranian drones as we stand up for Israel's security. Mr Speaker, we also worry about what Prime Minister Netanyahu and his government will do next. The Prime Minister rightly says we must prevent further escalation. So does he agree that the best way to achieve that is to press all sides to agree to an immediate bilateral ceasefire in Gaza to get the hostages home, to get the aid in, and put us on the path to a lasting peace for a two-state solution. Yeah. Mr Speaker, we have repeatedly called for an immediate humanitarian <laughs> pause so that we can get the hostages out and more aid in and use that as the foundation to build a more lasting and sustainable ceasefire. But it is worth pointing out, which has not been mentioned by colleagues so far, that Hamas have yet again rejected another offer to release hostages and it's important that we don't lose sight of that. We must have the hostages released as part of any of those conversations and it was Hamas yet again over the weekend who have rejected the latest round of those talks. Salim Fox. Mr Speaker, can I thank my right honourable friend for the leadership he's shown on this issue and echo his call for the need to avoid a spiral of escalation. But we've seen a, a military attack by Iran on a nation which its regime believes should not exist yeah, yeah. at all. Yeah. Iran has directly or indirectly engineered a war in Gaza with yeah. the aim of thwarting better relations between Arab states right. and Israel, right. especially yeah. Saudi Arabia. Yeah. We now have death and destruction in Gaza in a conflict that no one can win and where the only beneficiaries are Iran, its proxies and its allies. We have seen an Iranian journalist uh, attacked on British soil, and we've seen a, a vessel, an international vessel, being pirated by the IRGC in international waters. Another vile example of hostage taking. So I ask my right honourable friend again: Why are Iranians still operating out of Heathrow? Why are Iranian banks still operating in the city of London? When will the snapback mechanism be invoked? And what can be done to stop the export of Iranian oil to Russia and other countries, which is now keeping the regime afloat? Yeah. Well, can I thank my honourable friend for his leadership on this issue over a consistent period of time? And he's right to highlight 
the threats that Iran poses to us. I want to reassure him that on all the areas that he mentioned, active work has been undertaken by the government. As I mentioned in my statement, we discussed yesterday on the G7 call the need and benefit of coordinating further measures, perhaps including some of the things that he talked about, amongst allies in order to have maximum impact both on the regime and uh, on the ultimate designations of any future sanctions. I am pleased that our new sanctions regime that we implemented at the end of last year gives us extensive new powers. I am keen to make sure we use them to good effect, but where we can coordinate those with allies, I know he would agree with me that that would be preferable, and I can reassure him that that work is happening at pace. So George Hallett. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Could I too pass on my condolences for the loss of your dad, Doug? Uh, I was one of those who, on many occasions, benefited from his wise advice. The, there is no, as the Prime Minister said, there is no moral equivalence between two sides in this, what's happening in Gaza and what happened um, in the attacks from by Iran on Israel. He, it is the case, though, that um, Israel has made mistakes in the past and should be held to account for them. Would the Prime Minister agree with me that, as things move on, the importance of neighbouring states, particularly, uh, for example, Jordan, is going to be vital, not just in resolving the current difficulties, but also uh, in resolving a long-term future which brings about a two-state solution. In a, in a word, yes, I pay tribute to uh, the King of Jordan for the leadership role that he has played over the past several months. Uh, we are fortunate to enjoy a strong working relationship with the Jordanians, which was on display yet again over this weekend, and I commend him and his country for what they've done. Suella Bratham. Mr Speaker, please accept my condolences on the loss of your father. Yeah. Two weeks ago, Mr Speaker, I was in Israel at the northern border with Lebanon. And, of course, we've all seen what happened this weekend. But since October the 7th, Iran-backed Hezbollah has fired over 4,000 rockets into northern Israel, displacing over 150,000 Israeli civilians. I met some of those families. They're under siege. They've been uprooted. But they are brave and defiant in the face of terrorism and anti-Semitism. Mr Speaker, we have known for years that the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps is the world's chief sponsor of terrorism, here, here. funding and promoting terrorist plots, radicalisation and hostage-taking, both in the Middle East and at home. Mr Speaker, we have prescribed Hamas. We have prescribed Hezbollah. Prime Minister, why don't we put the UK's... Why don't we put... Prime Minister, why don't we put the UK's national security first by now prescribing the IRGC? Here, here. Uh, Mr Speaker, as the uh, Rana Mon lady knows that we don't comment on any potential prescription decisions, but of course we recognise the threat from Iran and have taken measures to counter it at home and around the world. I obviously refer her to my previous answer, but I'm confident the police, security services and courts all have the tools that they need to sanction, prosecute and mitigate the threats from Iran. We strengthened our sanctions regime recently and including sanctioning the IRGC in its entirety. Russia Nara Ali. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Despite the calls for a ceasefire here in our parliament and across the international community, the war in Gaza has raged, costing 33,000 lives, as well as the 1,200 killed by Hamas attacks and a humanitarian catastrophe that is now turning to a famine. For months, many have raised the spectre of the concern around regional escalation. Can the Prime Minister say more about precisely what conversations he is having with the leading figures in the Israeli government, as well as um, through uh, various parties to influence the Iranian regime to de-escalate as quickly as possible, given the seriousness of the crisis. Um, well, both the Defence Secretary and Foreign Secretary have spoken uh, to their counterparts over the weekend, uh, including the Foreign Secretary has spoken to the Iranian Foreign Minister specifically to urge de-escalation and condemn what happened over the weekend. I'm speaking to Prime Minister Netanyahu uh, shortly, and I can reassure her and all members of the House that we will continue, together with our allies, 
to urge calm heads to prevail and de-escalation. And we think that's the right course forward. And as I said, across all levels of government, that's the message that we were taking to everyone. Yeah. Ben Wallace. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. There is another country uh, that is under almost constant daily bombardment by Iranian made drones. That country is Ukraine. Some three years ago, I asked the Israelis, I pleaded with the Israelis to help Ukraine against Russia, and they refused, even though Russia was spending half a billion dollars in the Iranian drone programme. I know the Prime Minister is speaking to the Prime Minister of Israel later today. Now that RAF pilots have quite rightly gone to the defence of Israel, yeah. could he perhaps ask that Israel now decides that it is time to help Ukraine in their hour of need and we can see off both Russia and Iranian aggression? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, can I thank my honourable friend for the role he's played in ensuring UK security and that of our allies uh, over previous years? He's right, as my statement alluded to. Uh, as well. The Ukrainians are suffering from Iranian drones over the same weekend that this happened. And I'm also pleased not only will I take up his points of always with all our allies urging them to do more to support Ukraine, I know he will have welcomed the recent announcement a few weeks ago of more support from the, Ukraine, from the UK to Ukraine, specifically in the areas of uncrewed platforms on autonomous warfare to make sure that the Ukrainians both have the ability they need to protect themselves and conduct their operations. Uh, and the majority of the 10,000 new platforms that we are delivering to the Ukrainians uh, were also will have been developed in the UK, which I know is something that he was keen to ensure that we saw the benefits of here at home. I'm glad that has been realised, supporting Ukraine and their security and bolstering the British defence industry here at home. John MacDonald. There's consensus across the House, rightfully so, to call for restraint on the Israeli government. But we've called for restraint before. We call for restraint with regard to the attack on Gaza, yet the indiscriminate bombing took place. We call for restraint on the settlements in the West Bank, and yet the settlements have expanded. We call for a restraint so that food could be gotten to the children of Gaza, and yet malnutrition is killing some of them. So what action will the government take if Israel does not show restraint, because we're in danger of the Middle East being set alight by the decisions taken by the right-wing factions within the Netanyahu cabinet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mr Speaker, I'm sorry, I, I missed the part of the honourable gentleman's question where he condemned Iran and Hamas uh, for what they've done. Uh, but we will always encourage de-escalation in the region, and I'm proud of the role the UK is playing to bring that about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Kit Walters. Speaker, the Prime Minister was quite right to authorise the defence of Israel and, the, um, I guess, the avoidance of violence and death. But violence has also erupted in the West Bank, as he will know, over the last few days. What concrete steps can we take to protect those civilians too? Mr Speaker, the issue of settler violence in the West Bank is something that I have personally repeatedly raised with Prime Minister Netanyahu, as indeed have my colleagues, including the Deputy Foreign Minister. And we have joined with allies in sanctioning activity of particular individuals uh, where we, it has been brought to our attention and we will continue to ensure that the Israeli government does everything it can to reduce tensions in the West Bank. We don't think it's conducive to long-term peace in the region and that's why I said we've taken action where we can as well as being very explicit about our concerns with the Israeli government. George Galloway. Mr Speaker, I knew your father well for a very long time. He was a fine man and I am sincerely sorry for your loss. There was not one single word in the Prime Minister's statement of condemnation of the Israeli destruction of the Iranian consulate in Damascus, which is the proximate reason for the event everyone is here in concert condemning. He was not even asked to do so by the front bench opposite. Kay Burley is the only person so far to demand that of a government minister. We have no treaty with Israel, at least not one that Parliament has been shown. And the Iranians are not likely to listen to him when Britain occupied Iran, looted its wealth, and overthrew its one democratic socialist government in my own lifetime. <laughs> Uh, 
Well, Mr. Mr. Speaker, what, whatever may have happened uh, a few weeks ago, it is absolutely no justification for launching more than 300 drones and missiles from one sovereign state towards Israel. It's as simple as that. And in the honourable gentleman's question, not once did he condemn that action or indeed the actions of Hamas in the region. There is no equivalence between these things whatsoever, and to suggest otherwise is simply wrong. Yeah. Yeah. Robert Holton. Very much, Mr. Mr. Speaker. I thank my honourable friend for his strong support for the State of Israel. Um, last year, as Israel and Saudi Arabia were about to strike a transformational agreement, Iran-backed Hamas carried out its massacre on October the 7th with the aim of torpedoing the chance of peace between Israel and the Arab nations. And last Saturday's drone attack by Iran, being thwarted by Israel and her allies, including Jordan, demonstrated that Arab countries can work alongside Israel after this new period of contention. So does my right honourable friend agree that this represents a new opportunity for Israel and the Arab nations to rebuild relations in the aftermath of October 7th and bring the hostages home? Thank you. Mr Speaker, I agree uh, with my honourable friend. It is significant that other regional partners actually help to prevent a much worse attack over the weekend, and it reminds us how important attempts are to normalise relations between Israel and its neighbours. It holds out precious hope for the region. It's exactly that hope that Iran and its proxies are trying to snuff out, and we should work very hard to combat that. John Butler. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and my condolences to you and your family, Mr Speaker. Um, Prime Minister, I condemn Iran and Hamas. Let me start there. But we must not lose focus on the situation in Gaza, where there is a humanitarian crisis, uh, famine, and and it's just destruction that people are seeing in front of their eyes. But if we want to, if we want to ensure that the hostages come home, like the hostage that's been adopted in Brent, Noah Argumenti, we must argue for a ceasefire and not a pause. Will the Prime Minister clearly state that we should be calling for an immediate ceasefire on all sides? Mr. Speaker, it's, it's wrong to suggest in any way that we have lost sight of what is happening in Gaza, and indeed the G7, G7 statement yesterday referenced specifically our desire to cooperate to end the crisis in Gaza, working, to, working towards an immediate humanitarian pause where hostages can be released, aid can go in and build the conditions for a sustainable ceasefire, and crucially deliver more humanitarian assistance into the region. It is welcome that we have seen an increase in that flow over the past few days and weeks, but far more aid has to get in, and that is pressure that we will continue to put on all partners concerned. Sir Ian Duncan. Mr Speaker, my condolences. Can I commend my right honourable friend's statement? Uh, it's quite clear, as has been said already, that all roads lead back to Tehran when it comes to the terrible violence and the wars that take place uh, in the Middle East. And every country, not just Israel, but other Arab countries, fear what Tehran is doing in their countries as well, the thing we forget about. Can I therefore know that if we know that they are committing murder at home, they've, com they've executed thousands of protesters whilst uh, this war in Hamas has been taking place. So with all of that known, can I please ask my right honourable friend, when he sits down with our international colleagues and looks for other things to take place with regards to restricting Iran, please, please, could he now consider prescribing the Iranian uh, Revolutionary Guard Corps and to do it in a way that makes sure they can no longer ferment extremism here in the United Kingdom as well. Well, Mr. Speaker, I thank my honourable friend for his question. Uh, as I said to him, or as I said in the statement, we are urgently working with our allies to see what steps we can take together in a coordinated fashion uh, to deter and condemn what Iran is doing. Uh, with regard to destabilising activity here in the UK, you know, he'll know that the Charities Commission very recently have opened an investigation to a particular organisation, uh, and we will continue to use all the powers at our disposal to make sure that people aren't fermenting hate and undermining British values here at home from abroad. Sarah Sultan. Mr Speaker, I have notified the Office of the Member for Rutland and Melton that I would be referencing her in my question. 
It was recently revealed that the chair of the Foreign Affairs Select Committee told a private fundraising event, and I quote, the Foreign Office has re received official legal advice that Israel has brokered international humanitarian law, but the government has not announced it. So I have a very simple question for the Prime Minister, and if he can't answer that, if he dodges and if he deflects, our constituents will know that he is hiding the truth. Was the chair of the Foreign Affairs Select Committee telling the truth, yes or no? Yeah. 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 Well. Mr Speaker, I'm happy to address this very clearly. We have one of the mo most robust arms export licensing control regimes in the entire world. We have previously assessed that Israel is committed and capable of complying with IHL, but we regularly review our assessment, as she would expect. As the Foreign Secretary confirmed last week, the UK position on export licences is unchanged and following the latest assessment oh. is in line with our legal advice. Oh. We will keep that position under review and act in accordance with advice. And I would also point out to her that actually most like-minded countries have not suspended right. their existing right. arms export licences right. to Israel. Yeah. 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 Uh, Mr Speaker, I too uh, welcome the Prime Minister's uh, leadership in this area. Will he add his thanks uh, in addition to the thanks for the RAF who have uh, undertaken exemplary action this weekend, also those US service personnel who are based here in the United Kingdom, including many in my West Suffolk constituency, who were prepared to act at a moment's notice in order to defend the, uh, the attack on Israel, uh, which has been roundly condemned. Well, I'm happy to join my honourable friend in paying tribute to our colleagues, not just in America, but from partners uh, around the region who participated in a joint international effort. Uh, this was all uh, in support of Israel's own actions, and also their armed forces deserve enormous praise for the success in which they repelled this awful attack. Black. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I pass my condolences to you and your family for the sad loss of your father, Doug? We live in deeply unsettling times, and the Prime Minister is right, along with our allies, to call for a de-escalation. When the Prime Minister has these discussions with Prime Minister Netanyahu this afternoon, can he convey to him that now is the time to step back? There must be no further escalation in the Middle East. And, Mr Speaker, now is the time to recognise that both Israelis and Palestinians must live in peace. And in order to do that, we need that two-state solution. But as the former Prime Minister David Cameron said in 2014, when we had an outbreak of violence in Gaza, he then unequivocally called for a ceasefire. We must now, today, put an end to the conflict and the killing in that region for the benefit of both these countries. And finally, if I may say so, I welcome the comments of the Prime Minister on the situation in Ukraine. But we're all aware of the reports of the build-up of Russian activity. And I ask the Prime Minister, with our allies, that we must do more today to protect our friends in Iran, to give them the tools that they need to be able to defend themselves and to be able to make sure that Russia is defeated. Well, Mr Speaker, I'm happy to say to our honourable uh, gentleman that we remain steadfast in our support for Ukraine yeah. and we will not allow Putin to achieve his aim of eradicating freedom and democracy in that country. We have announced significant support. It was the first trip that I made at the beginning of this year and have encouraged allies to do the same. And we are committed to supporting Ukraine for as long as it takes, for not only for them to win the war, but also to emerge as a strong, sovereign and free country. Yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My thoughts and condolences are with your family. The United Kingdom stands for an international rules-based system respecting sovereignty and territorial integrity of other nations. And that is one of our key objectives with regards to Ukraine. Of course, I condemn in the fullest Iran's attack on Israel. And I have previously condemned Iran's malign behaviour in the region. The question that is on people's mind is this. What information or intelligence does the Prime Minister have with regards to what was going on in Iran's consulate in Damascus, which led to that attack by Iran? Because the international community and people around the world want to see the United Kingdom applying international law consistently across the board. 
Mr Speaker, whatever happened in that situation has not been uh, confirmed, and regardless, there can never be any justification for launching, as I said, over 300 drones and missiles towards Israel from another sovereign country, and it was right that we took action with allies to repel that attack. Richard Burgess. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker, and my condolences to you on the loss of your father. He'll have been very, very proud of you. This is a very dangerous moment. The UN Secretary General rightly told the Security Council last night, now is the time to defuse and de-escalate. Ordinary people in both Israel and Iran, across the whole region, indeed wider world, will pay the price if it escalates. The Secretary General also rightly reiterated the call for an immediate ceasefire in Gaza, as the Security Council voted for, given the huge loss of life there. This is the first opportunity we've had to question the Prime Minister since the recent killing of British nationals in Gaza. So is the Prime Minister planning to appoint an independent adviser to scrutinise the Israeli inquiry into those deaths of British nationals uh, in a similar way to the way Australia has done? Uh, Mr Speaker, I spoke to Prime Minister Netanyahu after that incident to express our very strong concerns about what had happened. We are carefully reviewing the initial findings of Israel's investigations into the killing of the aid workers and welcome the suspension of two officers as a first step. These findings must be published and followed up with an independent review to ensure the utmost transparency and accountability. Can I congratulate the Prime Minister for his strength defending Israel and wider peace in the Middle East? His strength in this area is world leading. Now, our friend, this country's friend Saudi Arabia, has now said in an official statement that Iran, quote, engineered the war in Gaza, end quote, in order to destroy the progress the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia was making in normalising relations with Israel. Now, that very important statement yesterday also said that Iran is a country that sponsors terrorism and it should have been stopped a long time ago. That's the Saudis saying that. So is my right honourable friend as hopeful as I am that the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia and Israel, both allies of this country, will normalise their relations as soon as possible, as it looks like they were on track to do before the pogrom of the 7th of October? I had a very constructive meeting uh, in Saudi uh, Arabia um, with MBS at the end of last year, and I know how important it is to normalise relations between Israel and its neighbours, and it's clear from this weekend, and indeed the comments that the Honourable Gentleman just made, that there is momentum and a desire to see that happen, and it holds out, I believe, precious hope for the region. Can I also pass our condolences from my party onto you and the loss of your dad? The UK should not either dictate or demand from Israel uh, restrictions in how it retaliates against the Iranian regime, which has shown it is prepared to take action to back up its threats to wipe Israel out. And indeed, the political and military support which we have given is very important. But can the Prime Minister tell us what direct action can we take here in the United Kingdom to disrupt the economic uh, interests of Iran uh, which is, uh, exists in our own country? Uh, we've already sanctioned more than 400 Iranian individuals, Mr. Speaker, uh, and as I said, discussing with our allies about what all we can do. Jason McCullough. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can I join the Prime Minister in paying tribute to the Royal Air Force personnel who were on operations yeah, 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 yeah. over the weekend? I also join him as well the importance of de escalating calling for maximum restraint, and when it comes to Gaza, working towards that sustainable ceasefire, seeing a flood of aid going into Gaza now to help the humanitarian efforts there, and also we all want to see an end to the bloodshed. But can I just echo the Chair of the Defence Select Committee in what we saw over the weekend, just showing the importance of investing in air defence systems to defend civilians from these hostile regimes? Uh, Mr Speaker, my honourable friend is absolutely right. Uh, whether it's with Ukraine, where we've provided Amrans and Star Street missiles, or indeed here at home, where, as I said, we've placed new contracts at the beginning of this year uh, to improve our air defence capability, it's a key capability that we need to invest in, and ideally we need to produce more of it here at home. Absol Khan. Uh, uh, Mr Speaker, uh, 12-year-old Zain Arouk miraculously survived Israel's bombing that killed most of his family in Gaza three months ago, but was killed 
this weekend by an aid airdrop when he was searching for scraps of food because the parachute didn't open. Zayn and thousands of others would still be alive had allies like the UK and US pushed Israel to adhere to the UN resolution on ceasefire in Gaza, which would allow aid to reach starving children safely. So will the Prime Minister set out exactly what repercussions Israel will face for failing to abide by the UN Security Council motion? Mr Speaker, I've been very clear that too many civilians have already lost their lives in Gaza. The UN Security Council resolution also called for the unconditional release of the hostages, which, as he'll know, Hamas rejected at the weekend, and it's important that we focus on that at the same time as getting more aid in. Stephen Crabb. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Speaker. There's one thing right now that would do more than anything to help end the conflict in Gaza, and that's the release of all the Israeli hostages yep. being held <coughs> by Hamas. Does my right honourable friend agree with me that no matter how well intentioned and no matter how much we all want the conflict to end as soon as possible, simply calling for an unconditional immediate ceasefire reduces the incentive on Hamas yes. to do the hostage yeah, deal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So long as they feel like they're winning diplomatically, right. it reduces yeah, yeah. pressure on them to do That's the right, right. thing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I agree with my honourable friend, and I've made the same argument from the dispatch box previously. It's absolutely crucial that as part of the immediate humanitarian pause that we are calling for, not only can we get considerably more aid into Gaza to alleviate suffering that people are experiencing, we must be able to release the hostages, and that's what we're focused on doing. Marsha de Cordova. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Whilst globally the, the attention is rightly focused on Israel and Iran, and we are all in agreement that the next step has to be de-escalation, the situation in Gaza is worsening every day. More than 33,000 lives have been lost, and more than a million will now be facing an imminent famine. Now, the UK almost stands alone in not restoring funding to UNRWA. So can the Prime Minister tell us when he will set out a clear path for funding to resume? <coughs> Mr Speaker, together with our allies, we are reviewing the interim findings uh, and are discussing appropriate next steps. Many partner countries have suspended funding to UNRWA after what happened, which was shocking. But in the meantime, we are considerably increasing our own aid into the region and welcome the commitments from Israel recently uh, to increase uh, the flow, opening new checkpoints, the port of Ashdod, the Jordan Land Corridor, Kerem Shalom. But now we want to see those commitments followed through. We all want to see more aid getting in, and that will be a focus of our conversations with Israel. Well, good. Mr Speaker, just on behalf of myself and uh, your neighbours in Bolton North East, very sorry for the loss of your, your father. Uh, Mr Speaker, 90 per cent of Iranian oil exports go to China. Uh, China's increasing importance in the region now already trades four times the amount um, than compared to the United States, the GCC countries, along with Iran. What discussions is the Prime Minister planning on having with his counterpart Xi Jinping and the Foreign Secretary Wang Yi in terms of resolving an escalation in the conflict in Iran? The, the Foreign Secretary recently spoke to his counterpart at exactly that topic, and more broadly, we're discussing with G7 partners and allies what further measures we can take to uh, deal with the threat economically that Iran poses. Nasha. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Uh, much has been referred to by the Prime Minister and members opposite about the uh, normalisation process between Saudi Arabia and Israel. The Saudi ambassador to this country on the 9th of, this, 9th of January told Radio 4 that that normalisation process was subject to a two-state solution and a fully recognised Palestine. And so, so I just wanted to put that on the record. And I want to remind the Prime Minister, support for any nation is not, not like the unconditional support that he has for his football team. When Iran acts like a rogue state in Syria, we call them out, rightfully so. When Israel taunts Iran by bombing their consulate building, knowing full well Iran will respond, risking further escalation, we must also call out Israel. What is the Prime Minister doing in his efforts to make sure that two-state solution, two solution and the recognition of Palestine is being actively pursued? Further, the Honourable Lady to my statement, where I made clear my commitment to a two-state solution and our diplomatic efforts to help bring that about. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy Speaker. My right honourable friend has made it clear that it is right and lawful to defend yourself and right and lawful for your allies to help defend you. 
But would you agree that it's also important to say that self-defence can be both effective and restrained, and more than that, that self-defence can be more effective in the long run when restrained, because it helps to retain the broadest coalition of those who support your position, and because it enables you to retain the moral authority to act robustly against others when you need to. Well, I think my uh, honourable friend put it well. Ultimately, Israel does have a right to self-defence, as any state does, but they have successfully repelled the Iranian attack, and Iran is even more isolated on the world stage, which is why, as the Foreign Secretary said, we would urge them to take the win and avoid further escalation at this moment. Sir Chris Bryan. Oh, thank you, Madam Speaker. The Prime Minister is right to say that we and our allies need to be very clear-sighted about the activities of Iran and Russia. But when you consider that there are British businesses like Avon still doing business in Russia and claiming that that is because it's absolutely vital and urgent, uh, when you consider that there is a massive shadow uh, fleet of tankers evading Russian oil mm -hmm. sanctions, and when you consider that many countries are importing, such as in Kazakhstan, so that they can then import into Russia, again to avoid sanctions, and when you consider that not a penny has yet gone from the sale of Abramovich's Chelsea to Ukraine, and we still haven't seized any of the multi-billion pounds of Russian state assets sitting in British banks, yes. isn't there further that we could go? Yes. Yes. Mr Speaker, we and our G7 partners have repeatedly underscored that Russia's obligations under international law are clear and they must pay for the damage that they've caused to Ukraine. Uh, I believe we should be bold and pursue all routes through which immobilised <coughs> Russian sovereign assets can be used to support Ukraine, in line, of course, with international law. This is something I've discussed with my G7 partners repeatedly. Uh, we've tasked finance ministers to that end, and they are reporting back ahead of the G7 summit in June, and I hope we can make further progress. Sir Simon Clark. And Mr Speaker, and I uh, would add my voice to those across the House who have called for the prescription of the IRGC as a terrorist organisation. Their tentacles are wherever trouble is to be found across the Middle East, and this is the latest uh, demonstration of their malign influence. Uh, can my right hand friend clarify uh, that with the threat of war growing in a way which I think bears grave risk to us here at home, that we need to set out a timetable to bring uh, our commitment to raise uh, the percentage of GDP that we spend on defence to 2.5% as quickly as possible, but we need specificity as to how we're going to do so. Well, I'm, I'm pleased, Madam Deputy Speaker, that in anticipation of the rising threat environment, we significantly increase defence spending by the largest amount since the end of the Cold War uh, just a couple of years ago, and subsequently to that by over £11 billion, specifically to uh, deal with inflation, strengthen our nuclear enterprise and rebuild our stockpiles. But I can reassure the House and my honourable friend that we will always continue to invest in our armed forces to keep this country safe. Joanna Cherry. Uh, I hold no candle for the Iranian regime, and in fact, I recently co authored a report on their disgraceful oppression of women and girls, and we concluded it amounted to gender apartheid. However, just as Iran must be held to the standards of international law, so must Israel. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, the Prime Minister has paid tribute to the brave three British aid workers who were killed by the IDF. Will he condemn Israel for their wrongful killing? And will he also condemn, condemn Israel for the ongoing slaughter of innocent life in Gaza? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I'll, I'll point the uh, honourable lady to my previous answers on both her questions. Thank you, Ford. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Um, Iranian drones have not only been fired towards Israel and Ukraine, there are also bi weekly shipments of Iranian drones arriving in Port Sudan to be used in that war, which as of today has now raged for a full year. So I'm very glad that the Prime Minister has made this statement today and is going to act first on financial sanctions and other measures. But does he agree that given that these Iranian weapons are now being used in wars in the Middle East, in Europe and in Africa, Partners not only in the West but also in the Global South should be deeply worried about how far the tentacles of terror from Te Tehran are now reaching. Uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, I'm 
I agree with the uh, my honourable friend, and that's why yesterday I discussed with G7 leaders the coordinated effort amongst allies to take further measures to stem the flow of Iran's malign influence across the world, and, and hopefully we can coordinate that action to tackle the precise thing that she's just mentioned. Khalid Mahmood. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. I deplore the attack by the IDF on the consulate uh, in Iraq. I further totally deplore the massive attack by Iran by launching 301 drones and missiles uh, on Israel, knowing full well that this attack will deter from the great work that we need to do in Gaza, supporting those people who are starving, who are mal mal suffering from malnutrition, young children, we need to support them to do that. Will the Prime Minister commit to the fact that he supports not, no escalation in, any, in, the, in the region by any of the countries that are involved at the moment, but has he said in his statement to concentrate on supporting young people and people that are dying in Gaza? Prime Minister. As I said very clearly, we've urged de-escalation and calm heads to prevail, and we continue to do everything we can to get more aid into Gaza. Francois. Thank you, Madam. Again on air defence, I wholly commend our RAF pilots and their superb Typhoon aircraft. But we only have 137 Typhoons. And because of budget pressures, next year the MOD plans to retire 30 of them and then sell them off, which would now be akin to selling Spitfires before the Battle of Britain. Will the Prime Minister, when he has a moment, go back to his office and place that ridiculous decision under immediate review and, at the very least, put those typhoons in a war reserve in case one day we need them for ourselves? Well, I thank my honourable friend for his question. He'll know that obviously individual uh, equipment and capability decisions will be made uh, by service chief in conjunction with ministers. I, uh, I'm happy to look at the, the, the point that he raised, but I do know we also are increasing our purchases of F-35 aircraft uh, and collaborating with Japan and Italy on building the next generation of fighter aircraft, something that we are leading the world in, but also will be fantastic for British jobs here at home. Derek Twig. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Uh, I, I do hope, as the Prime Minister said, that actually we can find a diplomatic solution, but I think we should plan for the worst. And I note that the Prime Minister, in his statement, said the threat to stability, is, the threat to stability are growing, not just in the Middle East, but he, and he uses exact quotes everywhere. So, uh, can I ask the. Uh, uh, may I also add, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, that our armed forces are running very hot at the moment. So, can I ask the Prime Minister, why did he come here today? to announce a significant, a significant uplift in defence spending to match the potential real and, real, real and potential threats that we're now facing as, as, as our yeah, country yeah. is. And why isn't that going to add to insecurity for our country? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll refer the gentleman to my previous answer about the existing increase uh, in our defence budget, not just over the last few years, but especially this year, in recognition of the increasing threats, and also just point out to him that we remain and have done over the past 10 years the second largest defence spender in NATO, behind only the US. Yeah. It is. Taken by the Prime Minister in the Armed Services over the weekend. I regret to say this, but some of my constituents feel that UK support for Israel has weakened in recent weeks. So, in the light of this horrific aggression from Iran, will the Prime Minister take the opportunity to confirm that there is no backsliding and that the UK stands shoulder to shoulder with Israel as it exercises its right to defend itself from a genocidal attack? Yeah. Uh, Mr. Speaker, as I was crystal clear, in my statement, we must ensure Israel's security. It's non-negotiable. It's a fundamental condition for peace in the region. And as we saw in the face of threats, like we saw this weekend, Israel will have always our full support. Yeah, yeah. Caroline Lucas. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy Speaker. Like the whole House, I condemn the attack on Israel by the tyrannical Iranian regime, just as I deeply condemn the atrocities of Hamas but I am also incredibly concerned that our Prime Minister has now pitched the UK into a perilous war and in support of an Israeli government presided over by Netanyahu, a man who chose to bomb an Iranian embassy because he's dependent on his hard-right provo provocateurs. 
This was itself a dangerous escalation by Israel and a further breach of international law. So if the Prime Minister's priority is indeed international law and de-escalation, then why isn't he calling now for an urgent bilateral ceasefire to get the hostages home and to get the region on the path to peace? Uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, we have called for an immediate humanitarian pause to get the hostages out and aid in, and will continue to do so. Uh, and I'm completely comfortable that what we did over the weekend was the right thing, acting together with allies to make sure that we could act in defence of Israel in the face of an unprecedented attack on its territory and people. Yeah. Sir Alex Hellbrook. Madam Deputy Speaker, may I um, congratulate my right honourable friend, the Prime Minister, for his um, holistic view to the situation taking place in um, Israel, Gaza and, of course, Iran. And may I say how glad I am that he has categorically said that we will carry on supplying the arms that Israel needs to defend itself, which has been proven to be so vital just this weekend. Does my right honourable friend agree with me that in order to try and achieve a sustainable ceasefire, that we also, that the Middle East has to um, confront the threat that Iran makes. Its, um, its direct influence in Yemen is having an impact um, on shipping through the Red Sea. That's having an impact on the war which is in Sudan, and it's having an impact in the war in Gaza and the effect on Israel and surrounding countries such as Lebanon. So may I ask my right honourable friend um, to do everything he can to make sure that the whole of the region recognises that Iran plays a large part in all of the suffering we're seeing in the area. My uh, honourable friend is right to point out Iran's support for the Houthi militia who have carried out a series of dangerous and destabilising attacks against shipping in the Red Sea, uh, and that's why the UK, together with allies, stood up to take action against that and are currently engaged in the multinational Operation Prosperity Guardian to further deter uh, Houthi and Iranian aggression. Sir Stephen Timms. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. I, I welcome the support of the Prime Minister and the Government for the resolution on Gaza adopted recently by the United Nations Security Council. Israel is currently in breach of that resolution. How does that affect his view of the current actions of Israel in the Middle East? That resolution also calls for the release of the hostages which Hamas rejected just this weekend. Uh, David Jones. Deputy Speaker, further to the points made by my right honourable friend, the friends, the members for Fareham and Chingford and Woodford Green, uh, Iran's Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps is not only the principal uh, sponsor of terrorism in the Middle East, it is also active on the streets of the United Kingdom. Uh, indeed, the uh, Iranian journalist Puryea Zirati, who was almost fatally stabbed last month, was under threat from the IRGC. And it's uh, actually the case that IRGC officials can be seen dining out in restaurants in West London quite regularly. Whilst I fully understand that my right honourable friend will not flag up any such uh, action in advance, can he confirm that he will take into account what I believe to be the overwhelming feeling in this House, uh, which is that the IRGC should be proscribed as a terrorist organisation? Uh, I'll just refer the uh, honourable gentleman to my previous answers, but also remind him that the National Security Act uh, creates new offences which give us the powers to arrest and detain people suspected of involvement in state threats on our soil. Uh, Thank you very much, Madam Deputy Speaker. I share the hope for calm and de-escalation. Without it, the UN Secretary-General has said the Middle East faces a real danger of devastating full-scale conflict. Can the Prime Minister tell us what the parameters are of UK military involvement in the region and confirm it will remain defensive? So, well, if, Madam Speaker, I'm not going to speculate on future hypotheticals, um, but as I said, we have sent additional jets and air refuelling tankers to bolster our existing operation in the region and will obviously keep the next steps under review. Dear Richards. Deputy Speaker. Iran has smuggled arms into the Middle East, including the West Bank. They've equipped and funded and trained Hezbollah, Hamas and the Houthis, as well as threatening British Iranians on British soil. And that doesn't even include what they have done to their own people, not least gassing Iranian schoolgirls. I thank the Prime Minister for the strong action over the weekend. Does he agree with me? We now must reconsider prescribing the IRGC as a terrorist organisation. Yeah. 
Well, speaker, my honourable friend is right to highlight uh, the influence of Iran with missile shipments uh, in the seas around them, and that's why I'm pleased that the United Kingdom is playing its part to practically do something about that. HMS Diamond bolstering our maritime presence in the region as we speak, uh, but also the UK has previously interdicted the supply of Iranian missiles being smuggled to the Houthis and others both last year and the year before, and will continue to be vigilant in the area. Mr. Carmichael. Speaker. I hope that the Prime Minister has heard the very strong and broad consensus that there is in this House now on the need for stability and de-escalation. So when he speaks to Prime Minister Netanyahu, will he make it clear to him that if Israel were now to proceed with their much-anticipated attack on Rafah, then that would not only be a humanitarian catastrophe for the 1.5 million Palestinians who are sheltering there, would make the release of the hostages more difficult, but would also make that stability and de-escalation more difficult to achieve, and as a consequence, will not have the support of his government. Well, Mr Speaker, we repeatedly raised humanitarian concerns uh, with the Israeli government uh, and the Foreign Secretary set out uh, just the other week our views on the situation in Rafa. John Whittingdale. Um, it is two weeks since uh, the journalist working for Iran International was attacked on the streets of our own capital. and The journalists and families of those who work for the BBC Persia service live under constant threat. Right, yeah. The organisation responsible for those acts is the IRGC working for the Iranian regime and therefore can I ask my right friend that he will look to see what further measures can be taken which would, should include outlawing the IRGC. I'm happy to reassure my right honourable friend that we are actively in dialogue as we speak with our international partners following the G7 call yesterday to coordinate further diplomatic measures to contain the threat from Iran. Madam Deputy Speaker, the core issue now must be the de-escalation and an immediate ceasefire on all sides, ending the devastating situation in Gaza and a political solution for the long term. UNRWA is arguably the biggest single multilateral tool to support a political solution and is unmatched in its administrative ability to deliver aid. The UK stands behind other countries in not renewing funding to UNRWA. So further to the previous question from my honourable friend, could the Prime Minister set out a clear path for funding to resume? I just refer the honourable lady to my previous answer. I don't think it's right to say uh, that we're behind other countries. We're in active dialogue with other countries on the approach to UNRWA. Recognise the role that they do play operationally and logistically on the ground, but also recognising the very shocking uh, concerns that all of us had about what happened previously. It's right that we take the time to get our future approach to UNRWA right. Philip Dunn. Uh, I welcome the Prime Minister's focus on calls for restraint and de-escalation, and I imagine that will be on his agenda this afternoon when he speaks to the Israeli Prime Minister. I also welcome his highlighting of the greater threats to this country. In light of that, could he, and recognising what he said earlier today about the future defence budget, could he undertake an immediate review of the resources and resilience of the British Armed Forces in the immediate term? Uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, I'm happy to tell my honourable friend that we do keep these things under constant review to make sure that we have the capabilities that we need to protect our country and stand up for our value and interests around the world. One thing that is clear is recent conflicts in Ukraine specifically have shown is how technology is changing warfare, which is why our increased focus on autonomous vehicles is so welcome and including building up our UK industrial supply chain. These are things that we need to focus on. I'm delighted the Defence Secretary has prioritised those areas. How Williams. Thank you, Speaker. Is there a danger that a, a further military attack on Iran would uh, serve to entrench the despotic regime in Tehran and strengthen its ability to oppress its own people, Iranian women, the Kurdish community, the Baha'is and many, many others? of its own citizens is appalling and we've repeatedly condemned them and called them out for that. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Last week 
I met with students at Woodbrook Vale School and Delisle College in Loughborough. Their question on this topic is now even more important than it was when they put it to me last week. What more can the United Kingdom do to help bring peace to this region? Prime Minister. Well, I point my uh, honourable friend to the statement. I think first and foremost we have to be resolute in protecting regional security and standing up for Israel when situations like this happen. Secondly, we have to be committed to a two-state solution, which we are doing everything we can uh, to bring that about. And I think the regional cooperation uh, over the weekend demonstrated there's much to be hopeful for. And thirdly, we must see an immediate humanitarian pause in Gaza so we can get the hostages out and aid in. That's the British approach. It's the right approach, and we'll work very hard to bring it about. Stella Creasy. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. The Polish Prime Minister Donald Tusk has warned that Europe is in a pre-war era because of the situation in Russia. The Prime Minister rightly said that these were not mutually exclusive conflicts but interlinked and therefore it is important that we coordinate. Just as we have seen there has been coordination at the United Nations, he will be aware of the very real concern that the UN sanctions regime on both Iran and Russia is being undermined. Now, the UN has combined together to support a ceasefire and to call for that. What more is he doing to make sure that the UN works for sanctions on both Russia and Iran? Does he recognise that waiting until June for the G7 to act may be too long in a situation where every single day counts to stop yeah. further military action? Yeah. Uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, what I was talking about with the G7 was regard to Russian assets, where obviously the G7 has an outsized economic role that it can play. So it's important that there is G7 coordination, first and foremost. Uh, when it comes to sanctions evasion, last year we funded the economic deterrence uh, regime that we have specifically to target sanctions evasion. She's right that it's a growing issue and one that I can reassure her we are tackling together with our allies. Uh, James Morris. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Notwithstanding the drones and the missiles which were launched by Iran and quite rightly taken out by UK planes and, and, and our allies, they prefer to operate in the shadows through proxies and through an increasingly sophisticated cyber operation. So would the Prime Minister agree with me that our priority should be working with international allies to go after where Iran is promoting illicit finance and weapons smuggling, as well as working with our international pa um, partners to combat their cyber operations? Uh, my honourable friend is Prime absolutely Minister. right. I can reassure him we are working closely with international partners, uh, not least on cyber, but also on weapon smuggling. As I said, I'm pleased that the Royal Navy is playing a significant role in combating that with interdictions of illegal arms shipments both last year and the year before, and contributing as we speak to Operation Prosperity Guardian. Uh, Andy MacDonald. Madam Deputy Speaker, I just point out to the uh, Prime Minister that a nation state having the capacity to observe international humanitarian law is quite different to actually doing so. But at this terrifying moment for the world, I think we're all mightily relieved that Iran, which must be condemned for what it did, um, failed in inflicting serious loss of life on people in the region. And the de-escalation call uh, is correct, as is the commitment not to engage in offensive action. But it was explicit in his statement that all people are entitled to security and peace. But sadly, for the people of Gaza, the calls for restraint have not worked. So what additional options is he considering? Because surely an immediate ceasefire, the funding of UNRWA, is the best way to secure uh, security for the region and also the release of all the hostages. Prime Minister. Well, it's important that the hostages are released. And that's what we continue to call for. And as the honourable gentleman knows, it was Hamas yet again this weekend that rejected the latest round of negotiations to get those hostages back to safety. I am anxious to be able to get everybody in, so I would um, plead for a uh, brevity in the questions, please. Thank you. Uh, Jack Lepresti. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Could I place on the record my condolences to the Speaker and his family? Could I commend the Prime Minister for his statement uh, and the leadership he has shown? But given this despicable attack on the civilian population of Israel by Iran, does he agree with me that the world cannot risk a nuclear-armed Iran? And will he commit to the House today that he will support whatever it takes 
including not taking military action off the table to ensure that this nightmare never happens. Well, as I said, there's no credible civilian justification for the enrichment levels that we've seen that the IAEA has uh, reported are happening in Iran. We're committed to using all diplomatic tools uh, to make sure that Iran doesn't develop a nuclear weapon, including using the snapback mechanism if necessary. Neil Handy. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Uh, I oppose all acts of violence and uh, I welcome the Prime Minister's calls for de-escalation and restraint. But I can't be the only person who wonders where those calls for de-escalation and restraint were six months ago. And given those calls, does he share my concerns that the political fortunes of uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu, in whose hands such a choice rests, are so heavily invested in the continuation of conflict? We've continued to call on the Israeli government to do everything it can to protect civilian life as it exercises its indeed right and duty to ensure security for its citizens, and I'll continue to raise those points with Prime Minister Netanyahu. Of Blackman. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Effectively over the weekend, Iran declared war on our friend and ally Israel. And clearly, when the Prime Minister talks to Prime Minister Netanyahu, he's going to have to be very careful about how he persuades him to exercise self restraint. So clearly a menu of options has to be what the British government and what are the British people are going to do in assisting Israel in resisting Iran. So the proscription of the IRGC, the removal of the embassy uh, here and, re and return of all those officials to Iran, our officials returning to the United Kingdom and the harshest possible sanctions against the regime in Iran are the fundamentals that are required. Yeah. Ms. Uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, we have already sanctioned over 400 different Iranian individuals and entities, including the IRGC in its entirety, and we continue to discuss with international partners how best we can coordinate future actions. Alex Davis Jones. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Everyone in this House is united in wanting to see the fighting in Gaza come to an end as soon as possible, with a sustainable ceasefire in place. As the Prime Minister quite rightly states, it was once again Hamas who had rejected a US broker deal which would see the fighting stop, hostages released, and allow far more aid to get into Gaza. So what pressure is the government applying to our allies in the region who provide support to Hamas to urge them to do all they can to make Hamas accept a deal? Uh, can I thank the Honourable Lady for her question and agree with her. We are doing everything we can, talking to allies in the region, to put pressure on Hamas to accept a deal and get the hostages released. That is the best and most important way we can move towards a sustainable ceasefire that we all want to see. Uh, Steve Double. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Can I thank the Prime Minister for his statement and the clear leadership he is providing on this very important matter? As a beacon of liberal democracy in the region, uh, Israel's security is our security. And it's quite clear from the weekend that uh, serious loss of life was only avoided because of the effectiveness of Israeli defence mechanisms supported by the UK and others. Does, so, does the Prime Minister share my concern that those calling for an arms embargo against uh, Israel are not only misguided, but they risk weakening Israel's ability to defend itself and encouraging those who wish Israel harm. Prime Minister. Oh, uh Madam Deputy Speaker, as I said, we stand by Israel's right to defend itself. It is important that they continue to abide by international humanitarian law. That will always be important to us, and we continually keep all arms exports under review, and we have one of the strictest regimes anywhere in the world. Madam Kaiser. Speaker, the events of the weekend mark a dangerous new chapter in the long history of conflict in the Middle East. Does the Prime Minister accept that proportionality is key and must include the conduct of all parties, including the 192 days of uninterrupted and constant bombardment of Gaza in response to what was, of course, a horrific attack by Hamas? It has now killed over 32,000 civilians in Gaza, a place where children and look to the sky, not knowing if aid or bombs are going to fall on them. Is that proportionate, Prime Minister? Prime Minister. Uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, we continue to support Israel's right to defend itself and ensure security for its citizens. It must do that in accordance with international humanitarian law, and we will continue to make that point to the Israelis. Greg Smith. 
Madam Deputy Speaker, I join with others in thanking the Prime Minister for his leadership in ensuring that the United Kingdom Government stands shoulder to shoulder with our allies Israel in the face of yet another attack. But will you agree with me that the first and most pressing mission for Israel so that they can live in safety and security continues to be the necessity to defeat Hamas? And that will, the harsh reality is, that will regard, uh, require an operation in Rafah, whilst every step must be taken to protect civilian life. Will my right honourable friend agree with me that that is the path to peace in the Middle East? Our um, honourable friend is right to highlight the threat that Hamas poses to the security and safety of the people of Israel. The Foreign Secretary set out in detail our view on the right approach to Rafah from this point forward just a couple of weeks ago. Andy Slaughter. Uh, the Prime Minister rightly calls for restraint and de escalation in the Middle East. Isn't there more chance that his words will carry weight if they advocate a ceasefire by all sides, including the warring parties in Gaza? Oh, Madam Deputy Speaker, we have called for an immediate humanitarian pause in Gaza so that hostages can be released, aid can go in, and for that to form the basis of a more lasting and sustainable ceasefire. Madam Deputy Speaker, uh, I thank the Prime Minister for his strong international leadership in this area and for his calls for restraint. The Prime Minister will agree that Iran is the dangerous and destabilising player in this region, whether by themselves directly or through their proxies. It's also a despotic medieval regime. There were 853 executions uh, last year, an eight-year high, including 22 women and young women. So as the Prime Minister works urgently with the G7, please would he confirm that no reasonable option should be off the table, including the possible prescription of the IRGC. Madam uh, Deputy Speaker, Iran's human rights record remains completely unacceptable. Uh, we've sanctioned almost 100 entities and uh, individuals specifically for human rights violations. For example, we condemn its surging use of the death penalty. And at the 78th UN General Assembly, we co-sponsored the Iran Human Rights Resolution calling for Iran to issue a moratorium on executions. Uh, once again, can I say I am anxious to get everybody in, but I can only do that if the questions are brief. Uh, Jeremy Corbyn. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. 33,000 people have died in Gaza. More bombs have been dropped there than were bomb dropped in the whole of the Iraq war. This weekend's horrific events uh, show just how dangerous it is that there's going to be an escalation into war across the whole region. Does the Prime Minister recognise that the central kernel to the whole issue across the region is the continued Israeli occupation of Palestine? What will he say about bringing about an end to that occupation and a permanent ceasefire? Prime Minister. Uh, well, Mr. Uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, uh, you know, of course we want to see and remain committed to a two-state solution and working hard to bring that about. Uh, but the biggest impact on regional instability is the pernicious influence of Iran and nobody else. Kieran Mullen. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Does the Prime Minister agree that even those that want to link the conflict uh, with between Israel and Hamas and their conduct with this attack have to surely recognise that since its inception, for decades, Iran has sought the destruction not only of our way of life, but of Israel and its people, and that we should never hesitate to play our part in preventing that. Yeah. Prime Minister. Uh, my honourable friend is absolutely right, and I agree with him wholeheartedly. Andrew Gwynn. Thank you. I also echo the calls for restraint and de-escalation. I was interested in what the Prime Minister said about uh, the diplomatic efforts over the last six months with the Palestinian Authority looking towards a two-state solution. Given the issues are settlements, water, access between Gaza and the West Bank and Jerusalem, what window of opportunity does he think there is with the Netanyahu government to get all parties round the table? Prime Minister. Uh, well, it's something we've continually pushed for, and in the meantime, what we've also focused on is building up the technical administrative capability of the Palestinian Authority so they are in a position to provide effective and strong governance for West Bank uh, and Gaza when the moment arrives when that is possible, something we work very hard to bring about. Janet Davy. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Uh, yesterday, the United Nations Secretary said. The Middle East is on the brink. The people of the region are confronting a real danger of devastating full-scale conflict, and now is the time to defuse and de-escalate. Does the Prime Minister agree with the United Nations Secretary? And if so, what is the Government Secretary to achieve this as he works with our international allies? Prime Minister. 
Well, of course, we do want to avoid further escalation and bloodshed, which would be deeply destabilising for the region and risk more lives. And that's a message that all government ministers will be taking to their counterparts across the region. Harry Gardner. Iran sought to justify its unjustifiable attack on Israel on the basis that it was retaliating for Israel's attack on its consulate. I welcome the fact that the Prime Minister has said that in his telephone conversation with Prime Minister Netanyahu later today, he will be urging de-escalation. In that telephone conversation, will he set out the measures that the UK will take if, in fact, Israel seeks to retaliate further? So I'm not going to comment on hypotheticals, but we will, of course, calm heads to prevail everywhere across the region. Beth Winter. Uh, well, Madam Deputy Speaker, at the Security Council last night, the UN General Secretary did warn of the danger of devastating full-scale conflict and called for de-escalation de and maximum restraint. And today, in response, the Foreign Secretary has said there could be, have been thousands of casualties and pressure for an ex escalation of this conflict. Does the Prime Minister agree with this? And does the Prime Minister also agree that the very real tens of thousands of deaths and casualties Israel's military attacks and imposed famine conditions have caused in Gaza are drivers of regional instability? Madam Deputy Speaker, we want to avoid further escalation and bloodshed, which would be deeply destabilising for the region and risk more lives, which is why we're calling on all uh, regional partners to focus on being calm and de-escalating the situation. Alison Toulis. Yeah, My constituent yeah. Sama has been trying to get her mother, her father and her brother out of Gaza since this conflict began. They've been displaced multiple times. They are now in a tent in Rafa. They cannot apply. There is no scheme for them to come to safety in the UK. Uh, and the UK government has this in its hands. It could waive the need for biometrics if the government so decided to. Will the Prime Minister do this and let Samus Farmer come to safety? Yeah. Uh, obviously, I'm not aware of the specifics of the Honourable Lady's case, but I'm sure if she writes to the Home Office, they'll be happy to look into it for her. I'm having Thank you very much, Madam Deputy Speaker. Four former UK Supreme Court judges and more than 600 lawyers, including over, 600, six, uh, over 60 cases, have warned the Prime Minister that the UK risks breaking international law over a plausible risk of genocide in Gaza if it does not stop its weapons export to Israel. But the Prime Minister is ignoring their warnings and hiding his own government's legal advice on this matter. Why, Prime Minister? Prime Minister. No, that's not right, Madam Deputy Speaker. So we have a very uh, robust and rigorous export licensing regime. The Foreign Secretary confirmed last week that the UK's position on export licences is unchanged following the latest assessment and in line with the legal advice. We keep that position under review and always act in accordance with that advice. Abby Abrahams. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. The Middle East um, has entered a very dangerous uh, new phase, uh, which can only be resolved by diplomatic and political solutions. So can I push the Prime Minister on what he uh, said earlier in terms of the sanctions that he is considering with international allies um, in relation to um, Iran, including the prescribing of the IRGC? And will he also confirm um, that the UK will not be uh, taking part in any offensive action of Israel's? Uh, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, no, we acted in a defensive uh, capacity and we're discussing with G7 allies further diplomatic measures that can be taken uh, in a coordinated fashion. Stephen Farrell. Thank you. Um, Iran's attack on Israel and the nature of the Iranian regime. The Prime Minister says he wants to see stability in the region, but surely there must be honesty and transparency that Israel itself is a threat to stability and has already systematically broken international humanitarian law. The government has no reluctance in rightly challenging Russia over Ukraine in that regard, but why the reluctance in, in relation to Israel and indeed to publish the associate legal advice? Minister. I said I, I don't think there's any equivalence between what Vladimir Putin is doing in Ukraine and what Israel is doing to ensure the security of its citizens in the face of an appalling terrorist attack. Christian Wakeford. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. It's been over 15 months since it was reported that prescription of the IRGC was imminent. Since then, Iran has continued to fund and supply Hamas, Iran has continued to fund and supply Hezbollah, and Iran has continued to fund and supply the Houthis. Following this continued funding for terror and destabilisation, what more does Iran have to do before the IRGC is prescribed? Prime Minister. As I said, the police, security services and courts all have the tools they need to sanction, prosecute 
and mitigate the threats from Iran. We strengthened our Iran sanctions regime recently, and the IRGC is sanctioned in its entirety. Helen Hayes. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. The Prime Minister said in his statement um, that it was important that aid gets into Gaza, and then he said a few moments ago that the government was right to take its time to decide on the restoration of funding to UNRWA. Madam Deputy Speaker, the organisational infrastructure of UNRWA is unparalleled and it cannot be replicated. A further delay on the part of the UK Government will cost further lives in a context in which famine is taking hold. Can I urge the Prime Minister to think again and to set out a path today for the restoration of funding to UNRWA? Well, Madam Minister. Deputy Speaker, I know the whole House will have rightly been appalled by the allegations that UNRWA staff were involved in October 7th. We want UNRWA to give detailed undertakings about changes in personnel policy and procedures to ensure that nothing like that could ever happen again. We're working actively with allies to try and bring about this situation to a rapid conclusion. I'll just say we're expecting final reports from the UN and others into what happened by the end of April this month and then intend to clarify the UK's position on funding once we've reviewed those final reports. Israel has indicated that against the advice of the international community, including the UN and the United States, that it intends to respond to Iran's attack. Such a retaliation could tip the region into a catastrophic all-out war. So when persuading Prime Minister Netanyahu against further retaliation. And in terms of leverage, will he say to Israel that should they choose to escalate, there will be no further UK military support for Israel's endeavours in this conflict? Uh, I am sure the Honourable Gentleman meant to also condemn Iran for what happened over the weekend, uh, but we will continue to urge de escalation and calm heads to prevail on all sides. Speaker, Iran is, of course, no ally of the UK, and its huge, unprecedented assault on Israel must be called out. But the UK government must now work hard to prevent further escalation of the crisis in an already volatile region. Now, it's a, uh, it is a matter of principle that diplomatic premises are not targeted. So, can the Prime Minister confirm what conversations he, had, he has had with the Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu uh, about the attack on the uh, Iranian consulate in Syria and whether he plans to discuss that with him? As I said, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, we will continue to urge de escalation and calm heads to prevail on all sides. Uh, and as Foreign Secretary said this morning, we would urge Israel in particular to recognise that it successfully repelled the Iranian attacks and Iran is ever more isolated on the world stage. Kerry McCarthy. Thank you. Jackie, the mother of the murdered aid worker, James Kirby, is my constituent, and I'm sure she'll agree with the Prime Minister's description of him as a hero. But there's a real danger, which I'm already seeing as events move on, that his death will end up just being chalked up as collateral damage in this conflict. So can I ask the Prime Minister to really show that he understands the, that the family need to see justice done? And can he keep up the pressure on Israel about this review? They want to know why he was killed and that someone will be held responsible. Yeah. Prime Minister. Uh, well, Madam Deputy Speaker, my condolences to Jackie and the families of all those uh, that were tragically killed as they were delivering aid. As I said, they were heroes and they absolutely deserve our admiration and our thoughts will be with all their families. Um, I'll refer her to my previous answer about what we've asked of the Israelis. And what's crystal clear, though, is there needs to be a considerable improvement in the deconfliction mechanisms between Israel and aid agencies. Uh, that's crystal clear. I've made that point already to Prime Minister Netanyahu, and we expect to see that followed through. Christine Jardine. Madam Deputy Speaker, I join my right honourable friend from Kingston and Surbiton in unequivocally uh, condemning the action of the Iranian regime on Saturday and in supporting our RAF in their actions. But my constituents in Edinburgh West, like many others, are concerned that now attention will be taken away from the plight of the Palestinians in Gaza. So can the Prime Minister assure us that when he speaks to the Prime Minister of Israel later today, he impresses upon him not only the need for restraint to restabilise the region, but that he has a unique opportunity now to take steps towards peace by making a gesture with um, promoting a ceasefire and allowing aid into Gaza? 
Our, our position remains unchanged. We continue to want to see an immediate humanitarian pause. So hostages are released, aid goes in, and immediately uh, we want Israel to deliver on its commitments to significantly increase the amount of aid getting into Gaza on the various measures that they've set out. Toby Perkins. Madam Deputy Speaker, the question from the right honourable member from North Somerset exposed that there is much more that we could be doing uh, to undermine the murderous Iranian regime. Simultaneously, uh, the way that Israel continues to ignore the United Nations uh, resolution is deeply troubling. Is the Prime Minister worried that his approach risks failing both on Iran and on Israel at the moment? Yeah. No. Uh, no, Madam Deputy Speaker. As we've demonstrated this weekend, the UK is leading with allies, defending our values and our interests, standing together with our friends to bring about regional security. That's good for people in the region, and it's good for people here at home too. Iran's reckless actions only add more fuel on an already raging fire. So, can I ask the Prime Minister? Uh, will he prescribe the IGC, IR, IRG? Sorry. <laughs> and what assessment has he made of whether bombing a consulate violates international law? What are we doing to uphold this principle in a war that's gone on six months and cost so many lives? I refer the Honourable Lady to any of my previous answers on both of those topics. Ella Hardy. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. In response to my honourable friend, the Prime Minister said he would take the time to set future approach to UNRWA right. So, as the famine continues, I wonder, the Prime Minister, how much time he actually needs before he makes up his mind to restore funding and get aid to the people who need it. Yeah. Prime Minister. Uh, what the honourable lady failed to mention was the shocking uh, allegations of people being involved in UNRWA, being involved in the, tra the massacre on October 7th. It is right that that is properly investigated and new procedures are put in place to ensure that that could never happen again. Those final reports which have been commissioned are due at the end of April. Once we review those and we're already in dialogue with our partners, we'll set out our future approach. But that's not to say we are not already doing an enormous amount to bring more aid into the region. We've tripled our commitment and right now are delivering aid by land, sea and air. We're taking a leading role and everyone in this House should be incredibly proud of what the UK is bringing to the table. Claudia Webb. Madam Speaker, the action of the Royal Air Force in shooting down Iranian drones and cruise missiles heading to and over Israel over the weekend raises a very serious question. Since the UK is clearly capable of acting to prevent airstrikes in both the region and both the ICJ and the UN Special Rapporteur for Palestine and the occupied territories have implicated Israel in a genocide in Gaza, why isn't the government interested in fulfilling its obligations under international law by protecting Palestinian women and children from Israeli airstrikes, why isn't the government acting to prevent the killing of Palestinians? Uh, well, I just disagree with the Honourable uh, Lady. Whilst, of course, we respect the role and the independence of the ICJ, our view is that Israel's actions in Gaza can simply not be described as a genocide, and that uh, case is not helpful at all in achieving our goal of a sustainable and lasting ceasefire. Matt Weston. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. The threat of uh, imminent famine uh, hangs over the people of Gaza. Aid urgently needs to get into the country and to be safely distributed. Uh, will the Prime Minister confirm, with the death of those three UK charity workers working for World Central Kitchen, has he received a written apology from the Prime Minister of Israel? Uh, I, I spoke explicitly to the Prime Minister of Israel, who did that when I spoke to him the very next day. We've made absolutely crystal clear our concerns about what's happened, and as I've previously pointed out, are looking now through the preliminary findings. Pleased to see the early dismissal of two or suspension of two officers involved, and now what we need is reform of Israel's deconfliction mechanism to ensure the future safety of aid workers. Rachel Maskell. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. In speaking to the Prime Minister of Israel this evening, in calling for restraint, will he put that into action? So, should the Prime Minister call, say that he will further assaults in, in Gaza or indeed impede aid? Will he action that restraint and call for immediate ceasefire? Prime Minister. Well, we've already called for an immediate humanitarian pause so more aid can get in and hostages can be released. And we ourselves, as I said, tripled our aid commitment and bringing aid in by air, land, and sea together with our allies. Alan Brown. 
you, Madam Deputy Speaker. So there have been over 33,000 Palestinians killed in Gaza, including 14,000 children, 76,000 uh, civilians injured or maimed, 700 health care and aid workers killed. Um, and given there is an ongoing famine, which the UK government, under his watch, is now trying to find ways around the Israeli blockade that is preventing aid getting in, is it not in itself an admission that the ongoing Israeli actions are disproportionate and should not be calling it out as such? Prime Minister. Uh, we have been consistently clear that we are concerned about the humanitarian situation in Gaza, have called on the Israelis to open, out, uh, open up more aid corridors and have them open more often. They set out a series of steps just recently, and now we want to see them deliver on those. Kim Johnson. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. The Middle East is in a crisis, and myself and thousands of my um, Riverside constituents have been calling for a ceasefire to end the destruction in Gaza and prevent um, the widening conflict in the Middle East. The Prime Minister has talked about diplomatic action towards a two-state solution. Can he say what action he's taking against the far-right ministers in the Israeli government who are opposed to a two-state solution? Prime Minister. Well, we have been uh, very clear that our view is that we should have a two-state solution, and we are making sure we do everything we can to contribute to that aim. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. On the wider humanitarian crisis in Gaza, there is now a famine across the area. And in response to a number of questions from my hon. Friend, the Prime Minister said that I think he said that he has now received the interim report on UNRWA and that in due course he will receive the final report. Will he publish the interim report, and if not, why not? And with Canada, France, Finland, Australia, Sweden and the EU having now restored funding, why does the UK stand alone? Yeah. Uh, when it comes to UNRWA, it is the UN uh, that is with publishing the expected final reports towards uh, the end of April. And after receiving those, we will clarify and set out the UK's position on future funding. Jim Shannon. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Can I first of all thank the Prime Minister very much for his decisive action, his support for uh, Israel, and thank our world class Royal Air Force for the preventing the further loss of life. Just last week I had an opportunity to be in, 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 in Israel to, to visit the kibbutz where the people were murdered, innocent Jews, to go to the Nova Musical Festival where over a thousand Israelis were murdered and to speak to some of those families. So in, in relation to Hamas and their sponsorship, the IRGC, does the Prime Minister agree that Hamas and IRGC can be likened to cancer and to save life uh, throughout the Middle East and retain stability that the cancer of Hamas and IRGC needs to be removed urgently by all means necessary. Well, the Honourable Gentleman is right to point out the destabilising impact of Iran across the region, including action through proxies like Hamas, the Houthis, and others, and we will do everything we can to counter that threat. Uh, Richard Ford. Thank you. Uh, our constituents will always want us to think about second order consequences of British military action. When the government deployed the RAF to defend civilians in Libya, a full parliamentary debate was held afterwards and a vote was granted to members of this House. This was in line with the Convention that has been observed for most of the last 20 years. Will the government grant members a full debate and a vote on British military action even after the action has happened? Uh, no, Madam Speaker, I don't believe that's necessary. I'm obviously here answering questions. It's my job to take action where I believe it is necessary, and it's just job of Parliament to hold me accountable for that. But it was right that we move quickly to respond to an immediate and dangerous threat. Publicising any action in advance would undermine the effectiveness of the operation. We acted in line with precedent, and we've also made very clear and public statements that we will not hesitate to protect our allies. I thank the Prime Minister for his uh, statement, and I suspect there will be a slight change of personnel before we, before we move to the statement from the Secretary of State for Health. Victoria Atkins. Thank you, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker. Uh, with your permission, I would like to make a statement on the CAS review of gender identity services for children and young people. And may I say how pleased I am to be joined uh, by parents of children who have been 
affected by some of the issues raised in this review, and I hope all of us will bear the sensitivities of this debate in mind as we discuss it this afternoon. This review strikes hard and strikes sure at an area of public policy where fashionable cultural values have overtaken evidence, safety and biological reality. This must now stop. As recently as 2009, the NHS's sole gender identity development service at the Tavistock and Portman Trust received fewer than 60 referrals for children and young people and just 15 for adolescent girls. Since then, demand has surged. By 2016, over 1,700 children and young people a year were referred, a 34-fold increase. More than half were teenage girls. In 2022, more than 5,000 children and young people were referred to gender identity clinics, and almost three-quarters were female. Madam Deputy Speaker, this exponential increase in demand is not a coincidence. It has been driven by a number of factors, which I will come on to later, but at its heart, it was driven by a myth. This myth was that for children and young people grappling with adolescents who were questioning their identity, their sexuality or their path in life, that the answer to their questions was inevitably to change gender to solve their feelings of unease, discomfort or distress. And this near uniform prescription was imposed on children and young people with complex needs without full and thoughtful consideration of their wider needs, including, as is set out in the report, conditions such as neurodiversity, experiences such as childhood trauma or experiences of mental health conditions, or indeed discovering who it is that they may one day fall in love with. Indeed, the response from some of the people who should have protected them, some of the clinicians in charge of their care at the Tavistock Clinic, was almost always to put them on an irreversible path, blocking puberty, then the prescription of cross-sex hormones, and onto surgery as an adult. In other words, such professionals were not asking the right questions of themselves or of their patients. That is why in 2020, with uh, the support of my predecessors, uh, my right honourable friends, the members for West Suffolk and for Bromsgrove, NHS England commissioned Dr Hilary Cass to examine the state of services for children questioning their gender. And I would like to start by thanking Dr Cass and her team for undertaking a considered comprehensive and courageous review into an extremely contentious area of health care. Since NHS England commissioned the review in 2020, they have unpicked meticulously what went wrong, what the evidence actually shows, and they have recommended how to design a fundamentally different service that better see, serves the needs of children. But I must also thank those who raised the alarm and contributed to the review over the last four years. The clinicians who spoke up against their peers to blow the whistle about what was happening at the Tavistock Clinic, even though it risked their careers. The journalists, academics and activists who listened to their stories and investigated further, even when they were derided as bigots and transphobes. The parents, who were just trying their best to support their children, but were so badly let down by a service that vilified them for questioning whether the interventions offered were the right ones for their children. And of course, the young people themselves, who have shared their experiences, including those who have gone through the pain of detransitioning, only to find out that the so-called reversible treatments they were offered are not, in fact, reversible. Madam Deputy Speaker, the Cass Review makes for sober reading. It is extremely thorough, and so I will not attempt to cover all of its recommendations today, but I genuinely encourage all honourable and right honourable members to read the report in full. 
it should concern every single member of this House that part of our public space, the NHS, was overtaken by a culture of secrecy and ideology that was allowed to trump evidence and safety. We say enough is enough. Our young people deserve better, and we must do whatever it takes to protect them. Since the publication of Dr Cass's interim report in 2022, a series of important changes have been made, and I want to put on record my thanks to NHS England's Chief Executive Amanda Pritchard and all of those at NHS England who have worked hard with Dr Cass to implement these. On the 31st of March, the Tavistock Clinic finally closed, having stopped seeing patients, uh, new patients a year earlier. Two new regional hubs have been opened in partnership with the country's most prestigious children's hospitals to ensure that children are supported by specialist multidis multidisciplinary teams, and indeed another will follow in Bristol later this year. In the last few weeks, NHS England made the landmark decision to end the routine prescription to children of puberty blockers for gender dysphoria. On the day of publication of Dr Cass's final report, they announced that they are stopping children under 18 from being seen by adult gender services with immediate effect. And an urgent review on clinical policy for cross-sex hormones will now follow without delay. I also welcome NHS England's plans to bring forward their full review of adult services, including Dr Cass's recommendation for a follow-through service for young people up to the age of 25. I also share Dr Cass's concerns that clinicians who subscribe to gender ideology will try to use private providers to get around the rules. Let me give a very clear warning. Prescribing is a highly regulated activity, and the Care Quality Commission has not licensed any gender clinic to prescribe hormone blockers or cross-sex hormones to people under the age of 16. Any clinic that does may be committing extremely serious regulatory offences for which they can have their licence revoked and their clinicians can be struck off. My officials have been in contact with the CQC following the final report to ask that they look again at the age thresholds in their licensing conditions. The CQC has also reassured us that they will incorporate Dr Cass's recommendations into their safe care and treatment standards for all care providers. This means that all new providers will be asked if their practices respect the Cass review and all existing providers have to meet the same rigorous standards when they are reviewed by the CQC. My officials met the General Medical Council over the weekend and will do so again in the coming days to understand how uh, they will ensure every clinician on their register follows their code of practice and implements the wider findings of the CAS review. It is morally and medically reprehensible that some online providers not registered in the UK have stated their intention to continue to issue prescriptions to children in this country, and I am looking closely at closing what can be done to cur curtail any loopholes in prescribing practices, including legislative options. Nothing is off the table, and I will update the House in due course as we progress this work at pace. Dr Cass also found that there was a lack of robust data on what happened to the 9,000 children who were treated by gender identity services between 2009 and 2020. Many went on to continue their treatment at adult clinics, and the University of York had been due to research the long-term long consequences of treatment they received as children so that we can properly support them through their journey into adulthood. It was expected to provide important insights into the clinic's work, including how many patients detransitioned, how many were also diagnosed with a mental health condition or uh, an autism spectrum disorder. We took this government the unprecedented step of changing the law to make it possible for adult gender clinics to share medical data with the university. All bar one of the adult gender clinics refused to cooperate with this vital research. This is unacceptable 
to quote Dr Cass, I'd go even further, I think it is deplorable. It is a dereliction of their professional duty. And so I am pleased to update the House that following the publication of Dr Cass's report, I have been informed that all seven clinical leads for the adult gender services now intend to fully participate in this important work. Dr Cass also concludes that a cultural shift alone does not adequately explain the huge growth in young women being referred to gender services. She paints an alarming picture of digitally engaged young women who are frequently exposed to pornography, involving violent, coercive, degrading and pain-inducing acts. Is it any wonder that more and more of them are looking for ways to opt out of becoming women? This is deeply troubling, and as Dr Cass makes clear, we have a duty to support these young women with considered evidence-based care. Madam Deputy Speaker, our children deserve health care that is compassionate, caring and careful. Their safety and uh, well-being must come above any other concern, and anyone who threatens it must be held to account. I will work with NHS England to root out the ideology that has caused so much unnecessary harm, to support those who have already received life-altering treatment, to give the next generation access to holistic care and to protect our children's futures. Anything less would be neglecting our duty to the next generation. This will not happen under this government, and it will not happen under my watch. I commend this statement to the House. Shadow Secretary of State, West Street. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Can I begin by thanking the Secretary of State for advance sides of her statement, and even more importantly, thanking Dr Hilary Cass and her team for the thoughtful and thorough way in which they have undertaken their work. She has navigated the complexities and sensitivities of this subject with academic rigour, providing an evidence-led framework for children to receive the best possible health care. I also want to pay tribute to journalists like Hannah Barnes and the whistleblowers who together helped shine a light on what was going on at the Tavistock Clinic. At the heart of the complexity around this issue are two things which are true simultaneously. There are trans adults in this country who have followed a medical pathway and who say that for all the pain and difficulty that involved, it wasn't just life-affirming, it was life-saving. Yeah. There are also people in this country who followed a medical pathway who say it was a disaster, that it ruined their lives irreversibly, and they ask how anyone could have let this happen. For the sake of all of those children, young people and now adults, but particularly those being referred into gender identity services today, we have a duty to get this right. Yeah. Yeah. What has emerged in the CAS review is a scandal. It is a scandal that children and young people are waiting far too long, often years, for care while their well-being deteriorates and their childhood slips away. Absolutely. It is scandalous that medical interventions have been made on the basis of shaky evidence. It is scandalous that despite all this, some NHS providers refused to cooperate with Dr Cass's review. And perhaps the worst scandal of all is that the toxicity of this discussion means that people have felt silenced and it required investigative journalism to prompt this review taking place. This, is partic this particularly vulnerable group of children and young people are at the wrong end of all of the statistics for mental ill health, suicide and self-harm. There is no doubt that they have been very badly let down. So we owe it to them to approach this discussion with the same care and sensitivity with which Dr Cass undertook her review. There are parts of this report which will sound familiar to anyone acquainted with the NHS today. Children and young people face unacceptably long waiting lists. They are unable to get the help, mental health support and assessments they require. The services face significant staff shortages, with a lack of workforce planning driving all of it. As with so many parts of the NHS today, this report paints a picture of a service unable to cope with demand. Dr Cass is clear that care must be personal and holistic. So can the Secretary of State set out how she plans to cut waiting times 
for assessments for mental health and neurodevelopmental conditions. Waiting lists are so bad in some cases that children are passing into adulthood before they have had their first appointment with gender identity services, leaving them facing a cliff edge. CAS recommends follow-through services up to the age of 25 to ensure continuity of care. Can the Secretary of State provide an indication of how long she thinks it will take to establish these services? Madam Deputy Speaker, Labour welcomed the decision taken by NHS England last month to stop the routine prescription of puberty blockers to under-18s. The loophole that now exists for private providers risks sparking a black market. The Secretary of State has said she expects private clinics to follow the recommendations in this report, indeed to follow the evidence. Can I underline our support for her expectations on compliance? And can she give an indication as to whether she thinks further regulation may be needed to ensure adequate enforcement of the recommendations? Madam Deputy Speaker, the refusal of adult gender services to share data of the long-term experience of patients is inexcusable, as the Secretary of State said, and I agree, it is deplorable. The data does not belong to them. It belongs to the NHS and, crucially, to patients. Of course, I welcome that they are now coming forward, but I also ask the Secretary of State how this was allowed to happen and what accountability she thinks would be appropriate. Madam Deputy Speaker, this report must provide a watershed moment for the NHS's gender identity services. Children's health care should always be led by evidence and in the best interests of children's welfare. Dr Cass's report has provided the basis on which to go forward. The report must also provide a watershed moment for the way in which our society and our politics discuss this issue. There are, there, are, there are children and young people in this country and adults, including trans children and young people and adults, who are desperately worried and frightened by the toxicity of this debate. There are healthcare professionals who are scared to do their job and make their views known. And Dr Cass has said, and I quote, Toxic, ideological and polarised public debate has made the work of the review significantly harder and she says it will hamper the research that is essential to finding a way forward. So, in conclusion, Madam Deputy Speaker, can I say that in, even in this, a general election year, there is surely one issue on which we can down tools and work together and that is in pursuit of the health care of vulnerable people. And, and can I also pay tribute to the right honourable member for Bromsgrove? We have many scraps across the dispatch box, but for his role in commissioning this review, he deserves our thanks and respect. And I hope that I can work constructively with the Health Secretary to put children's health and well-being above the political fray. Chief State. I welcome all of those who have changed their minds about this critical issue. Because in order to move forward and get on with the vital work that Dr Cass recommends, we need more people to face up to the truth, no matter how uncomfortable that makes them feel. And so I say to the honourable gentleman opposite me, I hope he has the humility to understand that the ideology he and his colleagues espoused was part of the problem. He talks about the culture and the toxicity of the debate. Does he understand the hurt that he caused to people when he told uh, them to just get over it? Yeah. Does he know that when his, he and his friends on the left spent the last decade crying culture wars where legitimate concerns were raised, an atmosphere was in, of intimidation was in, created and had the impact on the workforce that he has rightly described? They were scared or worried to go into it. And does he now have the good grace to apologise to those who have been maligned in public life, including his own female colleagues, and for the chilling effect that this has had on clinicians, journalists and campaigners who were trying to raise the alarm. 
I say this because I, you know, I want to believe the honourable gentleman when he says he has turned a corner on this. We now have to start with a new page for the sake not just of the um, children and young people that we are looking after, but also for the sakes of their families, many of whom will be watching this, living with the consequences of this ideology and this secrecy, wondering how on earth uh, the Honourable Gentleman is talking about general elections, when for them, every single day, every single minute that their children have to live with the treatment they have dealt with, uh, it will never, ever be reversed. Yeah. Uh, Dame Jackie Doyle Price. That was fantastic. Madam Deputy Speaker, um, this report is clearly very welcome, but has frankly been a long time coming. But one of the issues I'd really like to put to my right hon. Friend is really the whole failure of governance that this uh, shows. NHS England's specialist commission in particular require challenge here, because what was initially commissioned, as she's explained, as a treatment course for a small minority of people, has been allowed to expand unchecked and without any, any consideration of the ethics of what was being done to children. So can she tell me what she's going to do to make sure that doesn't happen again? And secondly, the tabby stock clearly enjoyed the popularity that it was brought to that institution by being at the front end of what was seen as a cutting-edge set of, of treatments. Uh, frankly, the governors allowed that to get in the way of what they should have been doing, which was patient safety. So could she also tell me what she prefers to do about that too? Uh, may I thank my friend who, uh, in uh, her parliamentary career, has done so much to shine a light on this sort of behaviour, but also the worries that she has espoused, uh, both publicly and privately, about the uh, children and the young people at the heart of this. Uh, so, in terms of what we are looking to the future, uh, the Tavistock Clinic has shut. It stopped, as I say, admitting patients a year ago. These new services that are already in place, the two new hubs, but of course the plans to expand further across the country, is about ensuring that we have a multidisciplinary approach to these young people so that exactly the um, experiences that Dr Cass sets out so starkly in her re report, all of those uh, con conditions are treated so that children are treated as human beings, as patients, not as siloed conditions. One of the main problems uh, that emerged uh, with the Tavistock behaviour and the, the way that it took place is that uh, gender, trans gender ideology was, or gender um, questioning was siloed in a way that no other health or mental health condition was and we want to move back to a place where clinicians are no longer scared of looking after children and young people with these issues that they see it as part of their general practice their general work that is how we are best going to address the very complex needs of many of these children and young people SNP spokesperson Kirsten Oswald. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. I'm grateful for advance sight of the statement. Madam Deputy Speaker, nobody's identity should be up for debate, nor should it be used as a political football. Indeed, Dr Cass said in her report, polarisation and stifling of debate do nothing to help the young people caught in the middle of a stormy social discourse and in the long run will also hamper the research that is essential to finding the best way of supporting them to thrive. And that polarisation is the last thing needed by young people in accessing care, their families and the NHS staff working hard to care for them. I wonder if the Secretary of State agrees that we must all remain respectful at all times when discussing these important issues and that decisions on this and any other type of treatment should rightly be made by clinicians and not by politicians. Dr Cass explicitly makes the point that her report is not about questioning trans identities or rolling back access to health care for trans young people. Indeed, supporting and improving the gender identity healthcare system for all, including children and young people, is what we should be focused on. So I wonder if she can confirm today whether any additional funding will be made available to ensure that young trans people can access the quality health care that they need and deserve. And finally, on conversion practices, the Government Equalities Office said last month in an answer to a written question that the Government expects to deliver a draft bill that takes account of the independent cash review. 
So can she provide an update on what conversations she's had with Cabinet colleagues on how the cash review will influence the UK Government's legislative proposals on banning conversion practices and when these are expected to be published? Secretary of State. So, um, may I urge both the Scottish uh, National Party in Scotland and indeed Labour in uh, Wales, because of course health is devolved in uh, those countries, uh, may I encourage them to respond as quickly as possible to the findings of this review? She asked me whether it's barnetised. For these purposes, our work to ensure that these clinics meet the needs of uh, our uh, population in England is not additional money, but we are reprioritising within NHS budgets to ensure that um, these services are spread across the country. I would encourage the Scottish nationalists to uh, prioritise the needs of their children and young people in the same way. I would also gently make the point that when it comes to uh, the atmosphere of this debate, I do not believe it has been helped by the SNP's highly controversial Hate Crime and Public Order Act. Uh, and I note, for example, the um, Twitter t- uh, behaviour and engagement on Twitter of very, very high-profile people uh, within um, uh, Scotland and the impact that that has had, uh, where people have dared to name uh, activists in this arena. I would also ask the Labour Party and the uh, Scottish Labour Party to explain to us why it is that they helped the SNP pass that Act, because to me this is all about the atmosphere. Uh, Chair of the Equalities Committee, Caroline Notes. Madam Deputy Speaker, Dr Cass's observations around violent and degrading pornography are chilling, and we know the impact that is having not just on young girls, but actually on all our young people. But her recommendations specifically include significant references to expanded services and follow-through services for 17 to 25-year-olds. Can I ask my right honourable friend what concern she has regarding the capacity for that, and what impact that might have for other areas of healthcare. We know that the transition from children's services to adult services can be problematic in a wide range of services, not least for those suffering from body dysmorphia, those suffering from eating disorders. So can my right honourable friend explain whether there might be any crossover where we could see young people then accessing some sort of interim service before the age of 25? And is there going to be more funding committed so that we can see those services and so that we don't, as all of us will face in our constituencies, see the horror of young people not able to access CAM services before they turn 18 and then become reliant on adult (coughs) mental health care? Well, um, may I thank uh, my right honourable friend, and uh, she is absolutely right to identify uh, the cohort of young people between the ages of 17 and 25 as being of particular concern. Now that we have a clear path in relation to the treatment of uh, children uh, and young people under the age of um, 17, uh, I have now asked NHSE to focus primarily on that next cohort because, again, speaking to parents, uh, one can only get a very real sense of the concerns they have as to the, uh, the word cliff edge has been used by them uh, as to the, um, the cliff edge between children and young person services and adult services. For this very, very vulnerable group of uh, young people, I do not want uh, that to be the case. And so we will see over the coming um, months work developed by NHSE to help this cohort. But I think she has a sense of just how transformational not just this report with its evidence is, but also the challenges that that uh, means that for our health service in England and how we choose to respond to it. In terms of funding, NHS England has committed more than £17 million to the two new hubs uh, in this financial year. I hope and expect that our devolved administrations will uh, commit similar sums of money to look after the children and young people in their areas. Uh, Dame Nia Griffith. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker. Well, she speaks there of the need to have multi-site centres and the fact that two hubs have already been put in place. Could you tell us a little bit more about what plan she has to expand to make it multi-site and when that's likely to happen? Secretary of 
Uh, very much so. We have started, as I say, with the two sites. We hope to expand uh, to Bristol uh, later this year, and there will be a further three or four sites across uh, the uh, country of England. However, and this is a really important part of the report, this isn't just about specialist services. This is about giving clinicians the confidence to um, practice uh, with, you know, to, to look after children and young people who may well be presenting at their clinics or their surgeries with this as one of a number of uh, conditions uh, and we want to give them back that confidence and that comfort that they do not have to just go down this narrow pathway of specialist services. Of course that will be appropriate for many but we want to treat the whole of the child not just this particular condition in the way that ha has happened in the past. Dr Caroline Johnson. Madam Deputy Speaker, and first I must declare my interest as a practising NHS consultant for paediatrician whose practice sometimes involves caring for children with the conditions we've been describing this afternoon. Um, the report is a very sobering reading of an example of where ideology has been allowed to trump evidence and safeguarding. And I want to bring the Secretary of State to one particular example, which is where um, individuals have thwarted attempts of the CAS report to do research into, into understanding better the outcomes for some children. I'm really pleased to hear they're now cooperating. But we do have a situation where, if you look at the uh, letter at the end of the CAS report, appended to it, from John Stevens, Stewart, sorry, the um, National Specific uh, Specialised Commissioning Director, he says that the NHS England wrote to all NHS trusts, chief executive and medical directors, and that yet still this data was not released. The duties of a doctor, as per the GMC, state that doctors should engage with colleagues to maintain and improve quality and safety of care. So, I ask the Secretary of State, who exactly blocked this data research? What, in, what investigation is going to be done to find out who was individually responsible and how will they individually be held accountable yeah, for yeah. their yeah, actions? Yeah, yeah, yeah. How was it possible in the first place for this, uh, them to do so? And what is she doing to ensure that data cannot be blocked in this way in the future? Well, um, I'm extremely grateful to my honourable friend who brings her clinical expertise and experience into this chamber in this very, very uh, important debate. Um, in terms of the precise questions of who did what when, uh, I hope she'll understand it. I've, I've been working uh, at pace over the last few days with this report. I have asked these questions and I will update the House uh, when I'm in a position to do so. But but I would draw the House's attention back to the expectation, not just the moral expectation, but the professional expectation for the medical profession now, in light of this review and the evidence it has produced, is that, med that clinicians and medical professionals will act in accordance with these recommendations, which will mean that when regulators look at the conduct of uh, medical professionals, they are doing so against this backdrop and against these expectations, so that if there are uh, people who are operating under the misguided apprehension that uh, their ideology trumps this evidence, then I wholly and fully expect the regulators to crack down on that. Uh, I am very anxious to make sure that everybody um, can get in, because I know it's an important statement. But we do need to make sure that the, the questions are brief, so the Secretary of State is able to be brief in response. We do have a big debate um, on the Rwanda bill, followed by another debate um, on the hospice movement, and I'm sure that uh, many of those colleagues will be wanting to participate in those as well. So perhaps if we can just bear that in, in mind in thinking of the questions. Uh, Rosie Duffield. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Firstly, I'd like to thank the Secretary of State for her thoughtful and considered statement on the CAS review, especially in mentioning the journalists such as my friend Hannah Barnes, who blew the whistle on the Tavistock Clinic. As she says, those who've raised this issue over the last few years, desperately concerned about the safeguarding of vulnerable children and young people, too young to make life-changing decisions, are owed a heartfelt apology for being no platformed, ghosted, sidelined and disciplined at the behest of a few extreme groups of activists, some within political parties. Does she agree that academics, politicians, writers, psychologists, well, psychologists, actors and anyone questioning their workplaces signing up to Stonewall Law have now been vindicated by Dr Cass's expert review and does she agree that they should be apologised to? Yeah. 
Well, Madam Deputy Speaker, I come to the uh, dispatch box with huge admiration for the Honourable Lady, uh, for the, uh, the, the commitment she and others on uh, the Labour backbenchers have shown, even though they were doing so in a, in a culture and an atmosphere where their views were um, demeaned, they were sneered at, they were castigated for so doing. Indeed, I hear rumours that uh, there were efforts made to remove certain members from the party itself. This is why, this is the moment now for uh, apologies, for humility, but also for us to have start with a clean page and ensure that when perfectly reasonable questions are asked about the medical treatment of our children, those questions are allowed to be asked in an atmosphere of respect and understanding so that these very, very vulnerable children and young people are looked after in a caring and careful way. Uh, Miriam Cates. Yeah. Yeah. Deputy Speaker, and I, I warmly welcome the CAS review and its findings and an extraordinarily strong statement from my wrong, uh, right honourable friend. I have no doubt uh, that what happened at JIDS will go down as one of the worst safeguarding and uh, medical scandals of our generation. But I want to pay tribute to the very brave parents, including those in the Bayswater Support Group, who have been raising concerns about this for years, raising concerns about the ethics and the safety of putting vulnerable children on irreversible and unevidenced medical pathways to achieve something that can never be achieved, which is to change yeah, their sex. Yeah, yeah. But those who spoke up for the interests of children and, frankly, for the interests of common sense were labelled bigots, transphobes, transphobes and even fascists. Yeah. And even after those concerns were raised and Dr Cass was commissioned, the Tavistock was allowed to continue to practice, which was a shocking suspension of the precautionary principle. This scandal happened because too many adults put their own desire for social approval mm. above the safety of vulnerable children. Yeah. Yeah. How can we make sure that that does not happen again? Yeah. 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 Well, as my honourable friend was asking that question, there were people on the benches opposite tutting her. And that shows that whilst some understand the need to keep this debate about the clinical and compassionate needs of these children, there are still people on the bunches opposite who don't get it. Yeah. And, and the idea that the Deputy Leader of the Labour Party, for example, would sign a charter in 2020 describing bodies like the Women's Place UK, which campaigns, dare I say it, for single-sex single rape refugees, something that the House knows I have an enormous commitment to, that apparently is trans-exclusionist hate groups. That sort of language is the language that needs to be apologised for so that we can all move on, because we are expecting clinicians, we are expecting medical professionals to do the right thing by this report and by our children and young people. There needs to be some leadership from all of us in, the, in public life to ensure that we are setting the right examples to those people. Christine Jardine. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy Speaker. Um, at its heart, the CAS report sadly um, highlights the lack of care or the, la or the low standard of care uh, for our young people. Yeah. That they were caught yeah. up in a toxic debate, there were long waiting lists, and indeed that debate seeped into the staffing of the medical profession. So would the, the Secretary of State agree with me now that we have to look at the well-being of our children, look at it holistically, and could she tell us how she's going to overcome the recruitment problems and the staffing problems that have been created by this toxic debate? May, may I thank the Honourable Lady, if I may say so, someone else, actually, who has an exemplary record of campaigning on this. Um, the, this comes down to the uh, very, very careful review that Dr Cass has herself written. It, it, we have to get away from this idea that if a child presents with gender distress, uh, that that is the only part of their health that we care about that we look into? Of course not. We have to look across the board to ensure that we are looking after every single part of them and also not assuming that medical pathways are the only and inevitable uh, pathway for them. I think one of the problems and one of the concerns that have been raised about the, you know, the, the terrible, terrible mental health um, that many children and young people suffer uh, in, in, these, in this report is that that wasn't being looked after. They were just put on these drugs and expected to get on with it, if you like. And that is wrong, and we are determined to change that. Paul Bristow. Speaker, what was the Secretary of State's reaction to the news that almost 
all gender clinics refuse to cooperate with the CAS review? And does she agree that this is a too important issue for a circle the wagons attitude? What can she do to ensure that government guidance is followed to the letter and in spirit when we tackle a gender ideology that seems to be running rampant through our public institutions? Yeah. Yeah. Well, Madam Deputy Speaker, this is not about my emotions, but I can tell the Honourable Gentleman I was disgusted and I was angry. And what is more to me, this is about um, the, our public space, our public space being able to have these conversations. And if, for example, a, mem uh, a part of our public institutions, whether it's uh, NHS, schools or whatever, are asked to respond to a very, very thoughtful and careful review such as this, then of course they must do so, mm. because this information doesn't belong to them, it belongs to their patients, it belongs to future patients, because we want to shape the services to help them, and it belongs to us uh, as a nation. And so, for me, the, uh, the welcome about turn that they were now going to provide this data happened, I'm pleased it's happened, but my goodness me, I wish they'd done it earlier. Uh, Dawn Butler. Thank you, Madam Deputy Thank you. Speaker. Um, all trans children and young people deserve access to high quality, timely health care and support. Mm. There are around 100 studies that have not been included in this CAS report and we need to know um, why. The, the Minister obviously is not concerned about the way the CAS report has been used to uh, perpetuate a broader hostile environment towards trans people in the UK, created in part by the government's delay to the GRA misrepresenting the report and this high and mighty attitude from the minister helps no one. Will the minister commit to extra funding needed to help young people have a holistic approach to their health care pathway? So I'm not quite clear whether the Honourable Lady supports this report or is castigating it. I, 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 I'm, I have no idea whether she supports it or not. What, what is interesting, however, is that we are trying, with this review, a very thorough review, a very thoughtful review, those are the words of her uh, front bench spokesman, um, that with this review we are trying to use this evidence to help clinicians treat our young people and children in a compassionate, caring way. That I've noticed, and I've had it reported to me uh, by others who have been watching this, that there is there, uh, certain um, campaigners are trying to build up a head of steam that this report is somehow flawed. It is not. This is superb evidence, and we are asking, and uh, the NHS has assured us, they're going to be acting on it. Uh, Jason McCartney. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. The CAS review highlights the deterioration in mental health in young people. Um, it particularly highlights the impact of social media, putting awful pressures on young people. Uh, the mental health crisis is obviously in both boys and girls, but particularly, as she highlighted earlier, in girls and young women. Will the Secretary of State continue to turbocharge and give CAMS crisis teams the resources they desperately need to support our young people? Um, may I thank my friend for his question? Uh, we, we want to help not just with crisis support, but to stop our, uh, help prevent our young people from getting into the position of crisis in the first place. And so we are rolling out uh, mental health support teams ahead of our schedule, actually, across schools. That's a really important piece of work that will be helping uh, already, we think, 44% of the, of the student population. We want to, of course, go even further. And we have uh, increased the number number of children and young people aged under 18 through NHS funded mental health services uh, from the 12 month period ending the Mar March 2021 to some 758,000 children. Of course we want that support to be there both in the community but also importantly to help clinicians understand that this is just one of uh, several sets of conditions that they should have confidence to work on to look after the child holistically. Sammy Wilson. Speaker. Uh, given the vile campaigns which are directed towards anyone who disagrees with the, the transgender uh, um, lobby, I think that we should congratulate Dr Cass and her team yeah, for yeah. having the courage yeah, yeah. to make the, the, the report which they have made. And also, I've got to say to the Minister today, for her robust defence yeah, of that yeah. report as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, given the, the, in, in light of the report, 
And given the fact that it seems that the transgender lobby has infiltrated the NHS in England, what steps is she taking to purge that lobby from the uh, NHS? And also, what discussions has she had with ministers in Northern Ireland, Scotland and Wales to ensure that the same policies and practices are not carried out in the public and private sectors there? Yeah. Mm-hmm. I say, Madam Deputy Speaker, that the reason I'm able to be so robust on this is because I believe it. I believe it. And so this, uh, which may be different from others, um, this, uh, the challenge that he rightly puts, though, to uh, NHS England is that we have to ensure that uh, it is acting as an organisation, but also at an individual and local level, to implement the evidence and the reforms that this report recommends. Uh, I, I, would, I just want to be, I want to be fair in, you know, to clinicians, medical professionals, managers and others who very much support this review. And so I want to help support them bring about the recommendations and um, issues as to what individual clinicians may or may not have done in the past will be a matter for both both NHS England, but also regulators going forward. The moral and the professional expectation is that in future, clinicians, medical professionals, all of us will respect the evidence and the recommendations of this important report. Angela Richardson. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. And I'd like to put on record my thanks to Dr Hilary Cass for her thoughtful and comprehensive review. Uh, does my right honourable friend agree with me um, that those of us across this House who for the last few years have been calling for a pause to wait for CAS um, because of concerns, not with the L, the G, the B, but the T element of the banning of the conversion therapy. Does she believe that we have been completely vindicated in our call? Well, again, may I thank my honourable friend very sincerely uh, for um, her, uh, her help in raising these difficult questions and doing so, as she has just demonstrated, in a very thoughtful and careful manner. I know she shares my concern that the children and young people at the heart of this should be our focus and that we need to build the system around them rather than them being slotted in to the system, as has happened in the past. In terms of uh, conversion therapy, and again, I'm being very, very um, mindful of the sensitivities of that of this. We um, are committed to supporting all victims of conversion practices, uh, but we do want to avoid any unintended consequences and assure that the draft bill takes account of the independent CAS review. And so that is why uh, my uh, cabinet counterpart, Minister for Women and Equalities, is leading the work in this area and very much considering this very complex issue as part of our approach to this sensitive and important matter. Tonya and Tony Atzi. Thank you. Madam Deputy Speaker, um, the starting point of all modern medicine must be robust and reliable evidence, in fact, rigorous. Back in 2017, I put in a written question because, at the request of my trans constituent, they were concerned that many, many adults and young people were putting themselves through a process and it wasn't the right one for them. That was 2017, Secretary of State. And we still haven't had much better data. And the data is the most important thing that we know that informs everything. There has been a chilling effect in this chamber. There has been a chilling effect on social media for people that have spoken out, that have asked questions like that. Questions you ask for everyday healthcare, and we have denied that, and the government has denied that for the children in our care. So please, Secretary of State, the member for Ilford North has been fantastic. He has shown great maturity and reflection on his comments in the chamber and in the media. So has the Secretary of State. But please, from one that has been at the other end of this to the Secretary of State, let's absolutely get the tone right of this debate and let's absolutely move forward. The CAS report is a great thing. We have to work with it to deliver the best outcomes for the children in our care. Well, again, I approach the dispatch box with humility because I know the journey and the debates and the questions that she has put forward, not just on behalf of that particular constituent, but on the wider issue of women and the treatment of women within uh, uh, healthcare, but also um, other parts of public life. Um, I've, I very much want us to view the future as a clean sheet so that we can 
build the, ser the services around the children, as I say, rather than expecting them to slot in to the convenience of some of the arguments that have been put forward in the past. But there is, and I think we have to acknowledge this, this has been such a long and toxic debate that there will be people who want answers. And I appreciate the fact that the Honourable Gentleman opposite uh, has uh, walked back some of his comments, but I do think it is important we acknowledge the toxicity so that we can move on and achieve exactly what she and I and others around the chamber. And interestingly, the people opposite are, sh are now, you know, they're now chuntering from a sedentary position. Um, interesting that I, I think we can make a real change, but a little less sniping from the sidelines, a little more constructive work is what is needed. Nick Fletcher. Nothing to speak here. I have called out this ideology locally and here in Westminster with colleagues at every opportunity available to me. At last, it appears the world is waking up to this issue. Sadly, we know of at least 9,000 children who have been affected by this scandal, possibly damaged for life. So firstly, I ask the Minister if she will establish a public inquiry into this issue. Secondly, alongside reforms to the NHS, we must re-establish safeguarding in schools. Will the Minister liaise with the education colleagues to fix our statutory safeguarding yeah. guidance, yeah. keeping children safe in education? This currently downplays the risk factor yeah. around a child identifying as trans. It must be addressed. And finally, I believe there are many bad actors who have paddled this nonsense, yeah. clearly knowing what they were doing while destroying our young people's lives. Madam Deputy Speaker, I believe if there is any justice, these individuals should feel the full weight of the law. I hope they are quaking in their boots. They ought to be. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, may I thank my honourable friend for um, his uh, um, powerful intervention just now and his question. I'm going to deal, if I may, with the point about the public inquiry because I know there are some who are asking whether that would be appropriate. I hope, I, will he take it from me that what I'm trying to do at the moment, bearing in mind that the report landed uh, less than a week ago, I am determined to drive forward the actions that are needed on the ground uh, to help children and young people. <laughs> I think actually we've had a four year review into this. You know, Dr. Cass has gathered a great deal of evidence. It is a very, very thorough review. And so for the moment, I want to concentrate on implementing these recommendations and on ensuring that the services are brought up to the standards he rightly understands. And on his second point, of course I will liaise with my right honourable friend in education. Again, this is about helping all public sector professionals uh, ensure that they are uh, acting on the evidence as set out in the CAS review for the sake of our children and young people. Joanna Cherry. Madam Deputy Speaker, can I warmly welcome this statement? It's not something she will often hear from me. But as she said, the CAST report has vindicated the concerns of many whistleblowers, including feminists and LGB activists, who warned of the consequences for children of unevidenced medical interventions and the ideological capture of the NHS. Now, for doing so, we and because I was part of this, we were defamed and hounded by organisations that many of us had formerly supported, yep. like Stonewall, yep. Mermaids, Pink News, who I had to yes. sue for defamation, and the misnamed Equality Network in Scotland. Now, to their shame, members of this House and members of the other place joined in this bullying and groupthink. So while I hear what she has to say about a public inquiry and about her immediate focus, being on implementing the recommendations. It does seem to me that we do need a public in inquiry yes. into how this institutional capture happened in our public bodies. And as we all know, it's not just the NHS, because we need to make sure that never again do ideologues of any sort or science deniers take hold of our public institutions. So when she's done with implementing the recommendations or as she's doing that, will she support the movement for a public inquiry into these matters. 
Madam Deputy Speaker, I'm, I'm conscious um, I've just answered that, but can I also put on record my thanks and uh, my respect for everything that the Honourable Lady has done in this field? She has, at times, had to walk a very, very lonely path, and I find it, Madam Deputy Speaker, extraordinary that parliamentarians elected by our constituents to represent the best interests of our constituents and, indeed, uh, of our uh, countries um, uh, would fa find themselves under that sort of pressure for simply stating biological fact. And so I hope she will be working uh, with me to ensure that the recommendations that are in the CAS review are applied not just in England, but in Scotland, in Wales, and I know in Northern Ireland as well. Steve Double. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy Speaker. I very much welcome this report and uh, in also very much welcome the very strong uh, statement by the Secretary of State in response to it. If there is one thing that should be above party politics, that should be above political ideology, that should be above cultural trends or virtue signalling, it should be the welfare of our young people. And this report lays bare that, sadly, that is exactly what has been happening. But this ideology has not only captured part of our NHS, it is found in many of our public sector institutions. So can I ask the Secretary of State, who has clearly taken a very strong leadership position on this today, if she will ensure that across government that the findings of this report are implemented in education, in local government, in social services, in our police force, to ensure that this can never happen again? thank my honourable friend and, and say to him that I view this, you know, sorry, I'm not using a prop, I apologise, Madam Deputy, but this report sets out the evidence. You know, the evidence was not there before. It has taken four long years of very, very hard work to gather it. It is now there, and I hope uh, and expect certainly that the um, health se sector will um, take, uh, implement these recommendations, but also actually that we can have a conversation about our wider public space. Uh, and I'm very, very pleased uh, to read over the weekend the article by my ministerial my cabinet colleague, uh, the Minister for Women and Equalities. I do think there is, we have got to depoliticise the public space and ensure that um, these principles, this evidence, is applied across the board for the health of all of our uh, constituents and our country. Lloyd Russell Moyle. Thank you uh, very much. Look, I, I welcome any research and this report that moves the debate forward. My reading of Cass is that she says there was a toxic debate on both sides, that there were people particularly nasty and vicious on all sides. I've had posters put out my, outside my house with rude words on them, etc., etc. It has happened on all sides. That's what Cass says, that it is unhelpful. She says it seems to be little evidence that there is large numbers of regret, but there is little evidence on large numbers of success either. There is poor evidence of effectiveness. There needs to be more evidence on the usefulness of social transition. To me, I read it, that there needs to be an awful lot of more evidence. But what she's clear is that young people shouldn't be denied access to health care if they are trans. In fact, they should have more health care and more pathways. So will the minister agree to fund research into this, not just getting the evidence from adult services, but proper research, longitudinal studies that can mean that we are evidence-based? And will the government support an amendment that would be cash compliant to my conversion practices bill that I believe can square this circle? I'm sorry, but uh, there is, I think, a certain amount of disbelief um, in the Chamber because I cannot be the only one who remembers the debate of January 2023 where the uh, member opposite not only uh, tried to shout down female colleagues on his side of the House, but felt so exercised about the debate, which was the, uh, to do with, I should say, Scottish, the Scottish Gender Recognition Act. He crossed the floor of the House to come and sit on the bench next to my honourable friend for Penistone and Stocksbridge. And I remember just how those of us on this side of the House were genuinely surprised that a Member of Parliament would think it was appropriate to behave in that way when debating something um, that we are, are entitled and should feel free to debate. So um, I, I'm sorry to hear that he has suffered the abuse he describes, but setting a good example starts at home. And would I, I hope he won't ever behave as he did in the Chamber that day, because that's how we uh, sort out this toxic, toxicity of debate. 
Douglas Ross. Deputy Speaker, the response from the Scottish Government to the Cast Review has been one of deafening silence. In fact, SNP ministers have buried their head in the sand and said nothing at all proactively about the review or its conclusions and recommendations. Indeed, the Scottish Conservative request to have a statement in the Scottish Parliament about the Cast Review has so far been refused by the SNP Green Government. So I welcome the opportunity to be able to speak about it here in the UK. Parliament. The Minister mentioned in her statement the recent decision by NHS England to end the routine prescription of puberty blockers to children. However, that is still available in Scotland. Can I ask her what discussions she has had, uh, have there been any, with Scottish Government Ministers and the UK Government on this issue, or indeed between officials in NHS Scotland and NHS England? Um, may I thank my hon. Friend for his careful and considered uh, question on this. Um, I very much hope that uh, the uh, Scottish National Government will look at the evidence into this very carefully and uh, find the recommendations to their liking. As I say, it is to NHS England's credit that they have acted so promptly, and I would hope and expect that the devolved nations, led by the Scottish National uh, Party and indeed the Labour Party in Wales, will follow with similar speed. I do note, however, and I've had to refer to it because I'm afraid it is in line with the atmosphere uh, in which clinicians are having to operate, this Hate Crime and Public Order Act brought forward by the Scottish National Government, supported by Scottish Labour, cannot help uh, with the uh, considered debate that we wish to have about this very, very complex subject. And I would encourage them to look at that as part of their uh, overall approach to this. Emma Hardy. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. And I welcome the CAST review and I welcome her recommendations. Mistakes have been made that must never happen again. But the polarised public debate she mentions reflects badly on this House. Yeah, yeah. So does the Minister agree that making jokes about trans people yeah. and trans children yeah. is cruel yeah. and cheapens the debate yeah. and moves yeah. the focus away from ensuring that all of our young people yeah. get the help they need when they need it? Yeah. 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 Well, it, it isn't simply... True leadership is not just about being careful about the words we use, and, and I'm not going to recite uh, many of the words that for example, the uh, other members of the uh, Labour Party have used about uh, trans issues um, and the fact they say, for example, that um, I think a cervix is... Uh... No, I'm not mentioning a member, but it's factually inaccurate to say only women had a cervix. I mean, that, that seems um, an extraordinary thing for a member of, uh, of the party opposite that wants to... They don't like hearing their words back at them, Madam Deputy Speaker. They don't like it. But I, I'm going to resist that temptation, and instead I'm going to focus on the application of policy. And when we look at, for example, the uh, treatment of um, trans prisoners, including those who are fully intact and who have been convicted of serious sexual offences, uh, demanding to be held in prisons that match their chosen gender, it is this government me as Prisons Minister, but many uh, of my predecessors as well, who set clear rules to ensure that the sorts of situations we saw, such as uh, the Karen White scenario, is not repeated. And so it was very, very troubling that uh, members opposite did not appear to have those same concerns when it came to the placing of a trans double racist, uh, rapist, Isla Bryson, uh, in Scotland. I'm being told it's not true. If they want to fact check, uh, apparently it was the Deputy Leader of the Labour Party who said it doesn't matter. Sir William Cash. Mr Speaker, um, I, I fear that uh, although I would like to believe that many of these problems will be resolved by guidance and by changing administrative rules and things of that kind. I fear that actually the real problem is a much deeper one. This is about the manner in which successively over the last, last generation we have actually brought in legislation which has facilitated these arrangements and I'm so glad that the government has put through the online safety bill which deals with platforms where a lot of this stuff has been spuriously put out by people who have absolutely no moral compass whatsoever. Could I simply say, you will not resolve this, if I may say so, to the Secretary of State, and I want to thank her for what she said this afternoon and the manner in which she's done it. Not only robust, but extremely effective. But please do not believe 
that this is going to be resolved yeah. just by changes in rules and yeah. administration. Yeah, yeah. This is about moral compass. It is also about telling the truth. And it's also, at the same time, about making certain that the legislation, whether it's the Equalities Act or whether it is related to human rights or whatever other legislation is required, will need to be changed, including the online safety. Or order, we really can't... I, I want to get everybody in, but we really can't have sort of mini-speeches. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's questions to the Secretary of State, so the Secretary of State can <laughs> answer them briefly. Secre Madam Deputy, the brevity of my answer demonstrates my respect for my right honourable friend's uh, observations and experience. I completely agree with him, mm. and uh, I will enjoy working with him on this. <laughs> Excellent. Neil Handy. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Um, I thank the Secretary of State for her very important statement today, and I welcome every word of it, as I do uh, the Cass report, uh, the final report. And I thank Dr Hilary Cass for her outstanding work in lifting the lid on this dangerous ideology and its impact on predominantly young LGB, but other gender non-conforming young people. The Secretary of State made a really important point, and that was the insinuation of gender ideology and its impact on the health service. But we know, and other members have made this point, that gender ideology has insinuated itself into many of our public bodies and insinuated itself into debate in this place. And there are uh, pieces of legislation being proposed in this place that would actually legislate to enforce the very conditions uh, in the CAS report where uh, gender non-conforming and other young people are denied proper uh, uh, psychological and psychosocial support to come to a reasonable discussion and uh, end point. Uh, what support will the Secretary of State give to have that conversation to weedle out this ideology elsewhere? May I thank the Honourable Gentleman for his advocacy on this issue uh, and uh, I very much hope that all members of the House will be able to use the evidence produced in this review and report in, the fu in future debates about legislation so that we can all make informed and uh, the correct uh, decisions on legislation. Leonici. Deputy Speaker, let's be honest, Secretary of State, what this very excellent uh, review does is actually expose institutionalised grooming and abuse by so-called professional medical people. What is she going to do now to make sure that those people who are pushing this from day one are now going to minimum be on the sex offenders list and actually be taken off being able to practice as medical people? May I thank my honourable friend and, and near neighbour? Um, if I may, I think that, that it, in fact, she's right, and indeed my right honourable friend for uh, Stone is right to emphasise it's not just the debate within the NHS, it's also actually the debate of what happens online as well, uh, because I know that parents uh, of uh, children affected by this are very, very aware of the online, as they describe it, grooming of children uh, with social, on social media. Um, I don't want to trespass for the time being on uh, the regulator. As I say, we have a, we've already had some very constructive conversations with the regulators, but the will of the House is clear that um, we expect the report to be um, followed and for clinicians to act on the basis of that evidence. Uh, Marcia de Cordova. Thank you, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker. And can I start by saying I welcome CAS Review's findings, making it clear that clinical services must be led by good quality, robust evidence, also highlighting the lack of and poor quality data and the need. We all know the important role that data plays in terms of delivering for patients. So does the Secretary of State agree with me that the, the review of adult gender services should take into account the number of patients with mental health challenges such as depression, anxiety, autism, self-harm, eating disorders and many others? And what additional resources will be put in place for mental health provision? And may I thank the Honourable Lady for her thoughtful question, because she's right to list just some of the mental health conditions that both Dr Cass, but also professionals in this area, have um, realised can be part of the complex needs of children and young people, asking questions of their identity and, and about their, their path in life. In terms of funding, uh, the um, uh, financial value of the 
contract last year with the Tavistock was £9.3 million, but for this financial year, NHS England has committed some £17.1 million for the two new hubs for uh, gender services, and of course we, they will keep this under review uh, as we build up the services across the country in the ways envisaged in the report. Uh, Richard Fuller. Much, Madam Deputy Speaker. May I add my thanks to Dr. Hilary Cass for her review and say that, having listened to this Secretary of State today, I am confident that young people in this situation are in safe hands as she implements the recommendations that in the Cass report. But I'd like to ask my uh, right honourable friend, the Secretary of State, about accountability, because what we've seen within the NHS for previous scandals, whether it's contaminated blood or Mid Staffordshire, that accountability is a little slippery about the NHS. Accountability is not just about lessons being learnt. It's about people being held to account for what they have done. So will my right honourable friend advise me, will she be looking at ways in which there is room here for people, if found to be wrong, to be struck off, for managers to be sacked, and in certain circumstances for criminal actions to be taken? May I thank my honourable friend for his question, and I completely understand his desire for accountability. I would, I would just uh, remind all of us that, of course, there are some clinicians who have acted uh, in a, an exemplary, a morally exemplary way, trying to blow the whistle on the practices they observed. What we, he and I and uh, I hope others want to do is to ensure that those clinicians who have not acted in accordance with their professional duties, that they are held to account. As I say, there are ongoing conversations with the independent regulators, but again, I suspect they have very much got the uh, understanding of the, the way in which the House is viewing this and the seriousness with which we view those clinicians that have not abided by their professional duties in this regard. Kim Johnson. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Many of the recommendations of the CAS review are to be welcomed. However, there has been some dangerous misinterpretation of some of the recommendations in public discourse and, crucially, in the response by the NHS England to recommendations for transitional services for 17 to 25 year olds. So, will the Minister join me in challenging the NHS? specialised commissioning team on the immediate limit of access to support to 17 year olds including cancellation of appointments for some who have waited years and calling on them to immediately reinstate access while they review next steps <laughs> I think the honourable gentleman, sorry, the honourable lady, and forgive me if I've um, misunderstood her question. I think she's asking me. Uh, she's referring to the decision that um, we, the NHS England, will prevent under 18s from accessing uh, adult gender, sorry, adult gender services. There is a referral. Uh, there's a consultation open at the moment, and, and uh, oh, sorry, it's just closed. We're looking at the results of that. But I am very, very sensitive to the needs of, uh, as I say, young people within that 17 to 25 cohort who, um, the, for, the, for them, the cliff edge, as it's been described to me, of moving from children's services to adult services may not, in fact, be in their best interests. And so I promise that that is very much the focus of my work in this in the, in the weeks ahead. Julie Moss. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Um, my experience of speaking with my constituents on this subject has been characterised by fear. Uh, fear often, I have to be honest, from mothers about their daughters and I have to say that it's fear of what's happening to their children but also the fear of speaking out because of the groupthink and the toxicity around the debate. Does my right honourable friend agree that Dr Cass's extensive evidence-based report <coughs> should mark an absolute turning point in ensuring that it's children first, non-ideological, that should be spearheading our approach to this debate in all areas, across government, in all government departments, not just the NHS, in education and in our public bodies. <laughs> May I thank my honourable friend sincerely. And she again articulates the concerns of many families uh, for whom uh, a, a teenager or young person in the family may be suffering very complex needs uh, and they are asking questions of themselves and their place in society, we must treat uh, not just the child or the young person, but also the family with care, with respect, and try to support them to get to the right place for their child. Chiomora. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. 
Constituents have contacted me who see in the CAS report a vindication of their long-held views on sex and gender following years of abuse, sometimes violent. Others have contacted me who fear that the CAS re review represents an attack on their very existence as trans people and fear the abuse to come. Would the Secretary of State set out that she opposes utterly the toxification and politicisation of questions of sex and gender? Will she also set out that she will co collect the evidence, the additional evidence that the CAS review calls for, without which there cannot be an evidence-based review approach, and also that she will put in place the resources that our young people need in terms of health care to ensure that they receive the health care appropriate to them. Yeah. Well, may I thank the Honourable Lady actually for giving me the opportunity to make it clear again that this is about treating, this report is about gathering the evidence to help support our children and young people to the best care they can have. For, for a very, very small number, that may well be a medical pathway, but for the overwhelming majority, we know from the Dr Cass report that, in fact, there may be other ways in which they can be best supported and, and looked after. And also, I do not want anyone um, to walk away from this debate thinking that for those adults who have made that decision you know, of their own free will, who are living their lives as freely as we all want them to, that this is somehow a, a report about them. This is not. This is about about the, the health care, the, um, uh, more, the, the emotional care and support that we give to young people, their families, and also the pro professional confidence we give to clinicians to ensure that we get to the right place for each and every individual child. Anna Firth. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker. Uh, the Secretary of State has made a very powerful statement today, which I welcome absolutely, and the CAS report. But we do have to acknowledge that without this government commissioning this report with support from other parties, this would not have happened because so many on that side of the chamber just stayed silent and thought this report was pretty much a waste of time. And to see the lack of any appreciation of that today is shocking and shameful. But the important points I wanted to ask was the timetable for the to enact the wider, wider findings of the CAS report. I'm very grateful for what she said about meeting the GMC over the weekend, but there clearly needs to be some work to be done there. And secondly, and really concerningly, what steps are we putting... Order, 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 order. I'm sure the Honourable Lady doesn't mean secondly, because she's not actually making a speech. She has one question to ask, and I'd be grateful if she would just ask one question, please. What steps the emotional and psychological support for those who've already undergone this treatment with irrevocable consequences. What are we going to do for them, please? Yes. Well, may I thank my honourable friend. Um, in terms of the, uh, her observations about uh, other, side, other parts of the chamber and their response to this uh, are well made, frankly. But in terms of the... Um, in terms of the Gosh, I'm being told they're not true. Crikey, they may have just opened up a bit of a Pandora's box on this. Um, the, uh, the point she makes about supporting uh, people who have gone through this process and who are trying to detransition, she is absolutely right that, um, that they need particular care, and I am actively looking into what NHS England needs to provide in order to look after these very, very complex needs that such people have. Ben Bradshaw. Has she seen today's very sad interview with Judge mm -hmm. Victoria MacLeod, uh, Britain's yeah. only senior transgender judge who has been driven from her job because of anti-trans hate, and particularly the trend among some politicians and opinion formers to describe being transgender as an ideology? She has used the term ideology, as have a number of her colleagues yeah. during this statement. Could you please clarify, for the benefit of this House, and trans people that she does not believe being transgender is an ideology. I genuinely thank the honourable gentleman for giving me the chance to re-emphasise that. When we have, when I have talked about ideology, it is the ideology influencing the provision of services, the assumption that uh, any child or young person who is questioning their place, questioning their sexuality, questioning uh, their identity and their their future path in life, the ideology is that that influenced those services which Dr. Cass has set out so very 
well. But of course, if an adult chooses to live their life uh, in a transgender, you know, as a transgender adult, then they must do so, and they must do so freely. And I would hope also with compassion and understanding from all of us, because I have always said, by the way, I've been talking about this now for many years. When I was Minister for Women, I uh, uh, talked about this. We must deal with this issue in a caring and careful way, and that is what Dr. Cass emphasises in her report. Robin Miller. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. I welcome this statement. The Cass report highlights the error of prescribing untested and irreversible drugs as puberty blockers to young people, but in Wales, the pathway for young people diagnosed with gender dysphoria includes <coughs> referral to gender services in England. Cass, the CAS report also warns against teachers being forced into making premature and effectively clinical decisions about affirmation, such as social transitioning, and yet this is implicit throughout the Welsh Government's own LGBTQ plus action plan and their compulsory relationships and sexuality education curriculum. Does she agree that these findings then have relevance for the safeguarding of children in England and in Wales? And does she agree that parents, teachers and health workers across England and Wales can expect politicians to take heed of these findings? I, I very much agree with my honourable friend. He has, he's always very, very um, good, if I may say so, at exposing some of the differences in treatment that patients in Wales uh, receive compared to treatment uh, of patients in England. I hope and expect that the Labour Party will uh, be true to its word, given that the leader of the Labour Party has said that Wales is the blueprint for how uh, they would plan to run the NHS in England. I hope and expect that the Labour uh, run uh, NHS in Wales will be announcing their immediate uh, adoption of these recommendations and the uh, transformation to services that we in England are already undertaking. Stella Creasy. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Many of us recognise the value of the CAST report, as my colleague from Brighton set out, in its call for evidence, its call for a thoughtful approach, its recognition that the collapse of CAMS has contributed to the difficulties of children yeah. accessing services. But I stand here today with constituents who have contacted me terrified, mm -hmm. and they are part of the group who are in the backlog. And I dare say thousands of those children have been watching this debate with their, with their families and are frightened yeah. to hear the heat, not light. Yeah. Now, I know the Secretary of State has a brief in front of her. Can I ask her a very practical question for my constituents who do not understand what this will mean for waiting times and delays? She said earlier she wasn't putting any new money in, it was being reprioritised. In practical terms, what will it mean for those young people trying to navigate what the ha what's happening to them who need our support and care, not our derision in any political movement, next? So I, I've already, I refer the Honourable Lady to my, the answer I gave earlier about funding. In relation to uh, the waiting list, it is precisely because we are removing the single provider of these services from the Tavistock. We've done that already. We have now set up two sets of services in highly, highly respected, world-respected children's hospitals, and we will add more. But again, this goes back to giving GPs and other um, uh, practitioners the confidence to look after these children as they would if they were presenting solely with, for example, ADHD symptoms or concerns about mental health conditions. This is about saying this is one part of the patient that they must uh, treat, not isolating it and siloing it in the way that has happened historically. Alexander. Thank you very much indeed, Madam Deputy Speaker. Prescribing hormone blockers to children is wrong. Encouraging and giving cross-sex hormones to children is wrong. And encouraging breast binding for children is wrong. And I believe we'll look back on this scandal, and this is a scandal in the last few decades in the future, with incredulity of how we did this to our children and especially our girls. We should all be embarrassed that this is the situation that we're in. But it's not just carrying on our hospitals and medical profession. This sort of ideology is going on in our schools. Does the Secretary of State share my concerns and many of my constituents' concerns who have raised it with me, but in private, because they cannot go this publicly, that a school in Rother Valley is fundraising for mermaids? A charity that is accused of encouraging young people to transition simply as they do not conform to gender stereotypes, even though they are too young to understand the consequences. Does the Secretary of State share my belief that mermaids and other such charities have no place in our education school and no place to help to hinder our children? 
Well, I thank my honourable friend, and I'll just, if I may, just set out the practical steps NHS England has already taken because this is important. And as I say, I hope other parts of the United Kingdom will follow. Uh, NHSE has banned the prescription of puberty blockers for gender dysphoria to children under the age of 18 years old. For cross sex hormones, they can only be prescribed at the moment with extreme caution for 16 year olds and older. That is on the advice of Dr. Cass. And no cross sex hormones may be prescribed to under 16 year olds for gender dysphoria. There are, of course, medical caveats to that for other uh, medical conditions, and we need to be very careful of unintended consequences, which is why this is such a complicated piece of work. But we want to ensure that these uh, drugs uh, are prescribed to the right people, if indeed they should be prescribed at all. His point about um, campaigning organisations, again, this is part of, I think, our collective frustration that our public spaces have become um, politicised and that uh, it, there is, I would say, there is no space for that sort of campaign activity in any of our public institutions. Uh, I appreciate, of course, a range of views must be represented. People must be help, helped. P young people must be helped to discover, as I say, their path in life, um, their sexuality, all of the things that is a one, such a wonderful part of growing up. But we have to do so in a way that is fair, that is rigorous, and that does not give way against the evidence into the realms of ideology, which sadly we have seen in some instances. Stephen Ferry. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I do welcome uh, the CAST review and the recommendations uh, merit uh, proper and full consideration. Dr Cass herself has called for, the tr for trans young people, their families and clinicians to be treated with respect and compassion. And sadly, I don't think we have seen that today in terms of some of the comments and indeed some of the heckles that have been made during this session. Will the Minister commit to challenging the harmful culture of transphobia in the UK, which is growing, and indeed which was challenged in 2022 by the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe, placing the UK alongside Russia, Hungary and Turkey? If the Honourable Gentleman wants to work constructively with me on ensuring that we deal with this report, we deal with the evidence in a caring and careful way for the benefit of children and young people, but also the wider trans community, I will welcome his support in so doing. Zara Sultana. Madam Deputy Speaker, while I welcome Dr Cass's call for all young people, including young trans people, to be, and I quote, treated with compassion and respect, I share concerns about important elements of the review, particularly given the context in which it was published. Last